President Jimmy Carter. This program is about two and a half hours. Jimmy Carter was a peanut farmer turned Georgia governor, a born-again Christian whose plain, honest manner and trademark smile resonated with American voters caught in the aftermath of Watergate. Elected to the White House in 1976, Carter promised Americans a change from politics as usual. He was born in Plains, Georgia, where at five he sold boiled peanuts on the street and later helped work the cotton, corn, and peanut fields owned by his father, Earl. His mother, Lillian, was a nurse who believed in racial equality to the chagrin of her community and who often cared for black neighbors too poor to afford doctors. Carter had an uncle in the Navy and as a young man grew to like the idea of visiting faraway places. After two years of college, he entered the Naval Academy in Annapolis, graduating three years later in 1946. That same year, he married his sister's best friend, Rosalind Smith. As a girl, she had patronized Carter's street side stand and would later agree to a date after seeing a picture of him in uniform. Carter spent seven years in the Navy, but returned to Georgia in 1953 to manage the family farm upon the death of his father. Within a few years, not only was the Carter Peanut Warehouse a commercial success, but Carter had emerged as a community leader. By 1963, he was a Georgia state senator, and eight years after that, Georgia's governor. He declared his candidacy for president in late 1974, surprising a nation of Americans who didn't yet know who he was. Jimmy who? Jimmy Carter. Jimmy who? I don't know who he is. Jimmy Carter's basketball player, isn't he? Carter made his outsider status work for him, however, and two years later was elected president. He remained down to earth. Carter carried his own luggage on official trips, lowered the White House thermostats to set an example during a national energy crisis, and designed a treehouse on the White House grounds for his nine-year-old daughter, Amy. A practicing Sunday school teacher, even as president, he also held to his principles. I am pretty rigid, Carter once said. It's been very difficult for me to compromise when I believe in something deeply. He disliked routine tit-for-tat politicking. The worst thing you could say to Carter, said his vice president, Walter Mondale, was that it was politically the best thing to do. As president, Carter helped broker a peace treaty between Egypt and Israel, as well as forge a new agreement with the Soviet Union, known as SALT II. His term, though, was also characterized by economic and political turbulence. Inflation veered into the double digits, and a prolonged crisis in Iran, where 52 Americans were held hostage for over a year, consumed the final months of his presidency as he worked to secure their release. He ran for re-election in 1980, but lost to Republican challenger Ronald Reagan. Carter returned to Georgia where he founded the Carter Presidential Center to help fight disease and poverty around the world. He also continues to be an active volunteer for Habitat for Humanity, a Christian organization that builds housing with and for needy families. I get a lot more recognition for building houses than I ever got for the Camp David Accords or for SALT too. Carter has said. The Carters have four children and ten grandchildren and divide their time between Plains and Atlanta. Well, not too long ago, I was interviewed on my 70th birthday, and the, and the interviewer asked me, what is the best time of your life? You've been a naval officer, you've been a submariner, you've been a businessman, you've been a governor, you've been a president. What's the best time of your life? And I thought for a few minutes, and I finally said, now is the best time of my life. We have all the advantages of having served as the leaders of the greatest nation in the world, and we have an intimate relationship with people who are suffering in 35 African nations, the Carter Center has projects there. We help to promote democracy and freedom and to end conflicts. And, uh, and we have a very good personal life with our family now, enough time to spend with our kids and our grandchildren. So I think this is the best time of life.
Anna. Jimmy Carter, the nation's 39th president. It was from here in Plains that Jimmy Carter planned his 1976 presidential bid, and from here that the campaign was shaped. We have several guests we're going to introduce you to today. Of course, your telephone calls. Doug Brinkley, author of biography of Jimmy Carter, The Unfinished Presidency. You'll meet Maxine Reese, member of the 1976 Peanut Brigade. Fred Boyle, superintendent for the National Park Service of this site. Leo Rebuffo, history professor at George Washington University, working on a book about Jimmy Carter. And finally, Annette Wise, teacher at the Jimmy Carter National Historic Site. And she uses that site as her classroom. We'll find out all about it. Doug Brinkley, you've thought and written a lot about Jimmy Carter. What were the circumstances in the United States in 1976 and that led to his presidency? And what role did this town play in it? Well, Jimmy Carter defined himself by planes. If you talk about Abraham Lincoln, you have to talk about Springfield, Illinois. If you talk about Harry Truman, you have to talk about independence. Jimmy Carter was the man from planes. And in 1976, actually in 74, when he started running as a one-term governor, Jimmy Carter defined himself by being an outsider. We're in a very remote part of Georgia here. Even today, it's a little hamlet, plains of 600 people. And Carter was telling the American people after the tumultuous 60s, after the Vietnam War, after Watergate, hey, I wasn't part of all that. I wasn't part of the Medicaid or Medicare um, care battles. I wasn't part of the Vietnam War arguments. I wasn't part of Nixon's Supreme Court uh, appointments. Uh, I'm a complete outsider. And he used Plains as the, as the cornerstone of his biography. Jimmy Carter ran an outsider campaign with the virtues of this town, this Main Street we're standing on, as being, I have Main Street values, and I'm going to return America back to a more honest government away from Nixon's Watergate and Johnson's Vietnam. So he used this place we're at right now as his springboard. As we usually do, we want to open the phones up, get our callers involved. There'll be two numbers to call, 202-626-1111, if you live in the eastern and central time zones, 202-626-1115, if you live out west. Want to get a perspective, Doug Brinkley, as we begin to walk down this street. Way beyond you is the water tower, and that sits right on road 280 and road 27, 280 being a U.S highway and right below that we'll see in just a moment peanut factories peanut uh, right. whatever warehouses and all that what did that have to do with all this well he's the peanut man jimmy carter that's what everybody remembers him as as being a farmer and a uh, agribusiness man if you go past that water tower um, about 10 miles into americas that's where andersonville prison was during the civil war the the uh, horrible concentration camp and right over here is the whole peanut warehouse facility of, the, of Carter's. That little brown brick building there was where Jimmy Carter kept his office. And he came back in 1953. His father was sick with cancer, uh, Earl Carter, and he died. And Jimmy Carter quit the Navy. He had a great naval career going. In fact, Carter had the second longest military career of any president this century after Dwight Eisenhower came back to run the, the, the family peanut business. And it was a warehouse, and they made a great deal of money. And it was the, certainly the most prestigious family in town. It was almost a one-company town, the warehouse facilities. President Carter sold off all of that, um, you know, after he left, um, you know, the, the White House in his uh, post-presidency. So the, and all around here, there are peanut fields and cotton fields. The state of Georgia produces about 40% of America's peanuts. Alabama is starting to catch up with it. So it is a, it's a, it's a peanut town. We're going to walk down this street and meet some more folks. The, the depot. The train depot is way down there, and we'll end up there in a few moments. But first, I want to make sure the audience got the right number. I guess we've changed. I don't even know this. We've changed our, our exchange. It's 624-1111 and 624-1115. And we do have a call. Why don't we grab a call okay, first up sure. from uh, Bloomington, Indiana. Go ahead, please. You're on with Doug Brinkley. Uh, good morning. Thanks morning. for this uh, great theory. Uh, my question is about the negotiations with Iran for the release of our hostages. I know that uh, Carter takes great pride in having kind of brokered their release. And I also know that some Reagan supporters feel that it was Reagan's election that actually frightened the Ayatollah into wanting to negotiate because he didn't want to deal with Reagan. And I just wanted to know uh, what involvement Carter had in the negotiations. And uh, do you think that uh, the Reagan side has any claim to credit for this? Thank you. Doug Brinkley. 
Thanks. Uh, that's a very good question. Of course, the um, hostages were captured in um, November of 79, and as you know, it was over a year that they were held there, and essentially people said Jimmy Carter was held hostage in the White House trying to solve that crisis. Um, the, there's a lot of speculation what occurred. President Carter's view is he did the best he could. He feels if he had one or two more helicopters in that um, failed rescue attempt, he could have gotten the hostages out and maybe won re-election. Of course, that didn't happen, and there were all sorts of negotiations going on. To the last minute, the big catchphrase was the October surprise. Um, my view of it after writing on President Carter is really that the Reagan administration, uh, it was just the threat of the Reagan administration perhaps doing something more brutal than what Carter was doing. And the need for the um, Iran to embarrass Jimmy Carter, they learned to really dislike him. They would burn you know, him in uh, effigy in, in the streets of Tehran, and um, they really learned to loathe Carter. And so it's that weird moment where Jimmy Carter is, just leaves office and Ronald Reagan gets inaugurated and the hostages get released. The person most responsible for the hostages released, besides Jimmy Carter himself, is really, I think, Warren Christopher, who did so much in the negotiations, and Hamilton Jordan, who kind of stayed at it all the time. One little sidebar I'd like to tell you, when that rescue mission was occurring in the, the summer, um, of 1980 and they're trying to get the hostages out, Jimmy Carter held a meeting in the White House and one of his concerns, and this is where his religious aspects took over in many ways, wanted to make sure that some of the, that when we were trying to get the hostages out, they, that our soldiers were using rubber bullets so as not to kill um, you know, any of the um, any Iranians. And it shows how religion plays into Carter's sense of, of nonviolence in a way. Let, let's go back to Plains, Georgia for a moment. Jimmy Carter still comes here. Jimmy Carter lives here. He lives just down the road here in a, in a home that he's lived in since the 1950s. And he also has an apartment at the Carter Center in Atlanta. But he's here most of the year. This is his home. Now along here are some familiar spots. The Carter Worm Farm office. And then you down there you can see on the window a cousin hot, cousin beady. Who are all these people and what role did this play in that 76 campaign? Well, this became a stage set for the Jimmy Carter's campaign because all the media came and suddenly discovered this remote town plains and they had ABC and CBS, NBC trucks here, everybody descending on this little town. And I might add it was a segregated town uh, with the railroad tracks, African Americans living on one part, whites on the other. And this main street block here is about the same as it would have looked at the turn of the century on top of Carter Worm Farm, you see 1901 on top of the building. I've seen photographs from that period and it's, it looks just exactly the same. And all many different Carter relatives and kinfolk have had offices here. His cousin Hugh Carter died this past um, August and Hugh was, took over the sta state senate seat after Jimmy Carter left it and he was a kind of a town rank and tour storyteller and wrote a book about the Carter family when Jimmy Carter was president and caused some embarrassment to the family. But you was a great storyteller and it sold kind of hokey peanut ware for tourists that would come here. But he was a, he was a wonderful man. We're going to meet Maxine Reese in a few moments. And those of you tuning in, we're standing on the one street in Plains, really. Right over there is the railroad tracks. And on the other side is the main highway going right through the community. And we've got a call waiting in Groveland, Florida for Doug Brinkley. Go ahead, please. I appreciate uh, the program. This has been a special occasion for me. I took the day off from work uh, because uh, my dad was born just up the road in Richland, uh, born October 23, 1924. We're related to the Carters. And uh, we wanted to thank uh, uh, the Carter, President Carter, Betty Pope, for putting together that family reunion we had last year in May. And I'm wondering if, if, uh, if everybody there on the, the program knows about the, the incredible family reunion we had last year with the President. And, I'd encourage all other presidents who are living to do the same for their family because we're proud of President Carter and what he's done for us and the incredible inspiration that he's doing now and what it has in our lives. And uh, one of my other questions was, is where did President Carter graduate in his class uh, in Annapolis? And uh, anybody know where President Carter is going to be laid to rest? Will it be there in, in Plains or will it be there at the, uh, the Carter Center? Thanks. That's all. Thank he was, he was 89th in his class at Annapolis and was very proud about that fact, except when he went to see Admiral Rickover um, to get his, hopefully to get a commission to work on the nuclear submarines, he ended up, uh, Rickover asked him if he did his best at being 89, and Carter had to pause for a minute and say no, and Rickover kind of turned around in the chair with his back towards him and said, why not? And hence, that became Jimmy Carter's uh, campaign biography, Why Not the Best. But he had an outstanding naval career, and I was able to also look at Jimmy Carter's post-Annapolis records, which I got from the archives with President Carter's help out of St. Louis at one point. 
Um, as for family reunion, yes, that was a big event. And all I could say is Jimmy Carter loves ancestors. Um, he loved, right now he's writing a book about the Revolutionary War in Georgia in the 1770s with Carter Kinfolk involved with it. He takes part to clear, clean up and fix the cemetery here in town with his ancestors. And he's somebody very deeply into um, his genealogy. He, when he ran for president, he said, what I wish every American would do is learn their own family tree. It meant such a great deal to him, and it continues to. As for where he's going to be buried, he's going to be buried in Atlanta at the Carter Center, back by the, what's called a Japanese strolling garden there with a pond, and they've determined that that will be the final resting place for uh, Mr. and Mrs. Carter. We're here in Plains, Georgia. As I said earlier, it's 150 miles south of Atlanta. It takes about two and a half hours drive. And yep. you made it uh, late last night. Uh, let's go to Spring, uh, Silver Spring, Maryland for the next call. Go ahead, please. Uh, hi, um, I'm a secular liberal, and the current governor of Georgia, um, I think his name is Barnes, just attacked Bradley as a northeastern elitist liberal. And I think he comes out of that Carter tradition. I'm wondering, did, first, did Carter start this, or did he just advance this sort of new Democrat idea that I don't like, where they're like, you know, cultural or religious moderates who, if, if you force them, they'd rather be called conservatives than liberals. And, and where did Carter stand on, like, you know, the issues of abortions, women's rights, affirmative action, gay rights? Because it seems to me that, um, like, he, he's like, you know, in that, that Clinton mode where he's, you know, he doesn't want to be identified with the people that probably got him elected in the first place, and that probably led to his downfall. Okay. Well, I mean, first off, one th way to understand Jimmy Carter is looking at his mother and father. Ms. Lillian was a, a liberal integrationist. I mean, an extreme liberal. She loved Jackie Robinson, and when he integrated, you know, baseball, and was for Joe Lewis and boxing, and was a nurse to so many Afri poor African Americans in this whole area here. His father, Mr. Earl, was a conservative segregationist. So Carter kind of saw both sides of it, and when he emerged as a as what you're calling a new Democrat in the 1970s, he did have to maintain a kind of conservative side to him, which is a real part of Carter, a frugality, a liking of uh, balanced budgets. He believes that he's a fiscal conservative, Jimmy Carter. On the other hand, he's a social liberal, so I think he is a combination of both. In many ways, your point's astute. Jimmy Carter was the first, if you'd like, new Democrat, or another way to look at it, he's the, uh, the first post-New Deal Democrat um, or post-New Deal president. Um, in, in many ways. Uh, but uh, Jimmy Carter is a, is a Baptist, Southern Baptist. There are about 20 million of them, including President Clinton and Al Gore and, and Trent Lott. We can go on and on. And he teaches Sunday school class here in Plains, just down that way. And he's there all the time, does Bible class, and tourists come, and the regular congregation comes. And in the ba Southern Baptist Convention, Jimmy Carter is considered on the liberal end of it. He believes that you have to help people with AIDS. He's not for abortion, but he believes in women's right to choose. So he is very liberal for the, if you look at the Southern Baptist hierarchy on women's issues and issues dealing with the homeless and the poor. And I think he's become less conservative as he's grown older. I think um, in his post-presidency, we're seeing him focusing a lot more on race issues, civil rights. I think he's much more of a liberal as ex-president. Let's take a call from Denver as we walk back over here across the tracks, and Maxine Reese is waiting to tell us some stories from she's the 1976 campaign. We'll go right through here. Denver, go ahead, please. You're on the air. Okay, well, obviously there's this great myth of uh, Jimmy Carter, the peanut farmer and such, and I'm curious to know how much of that is actually true. I mean, obviously, uh, here's a man who was governor. He was in the Navy and such. He wasn't out there picking peanuts. Uh, how, how much of his time was spent actually peanut farming and at what point in his life was he doing that or no, at no point in life was he doing that and either from a managerial side or out on the farm side uh, I'm just curious let me, let me ask you Denver why are you suspicious of the story uh, well I mean because he was a look at, I mean he had so many other accomplishments in his life going to the Naval Academy uh, being governor and I mean I'm sure he did some time he, my, my impression of it all was perhaps that he had sort of inherited the farm uh, but that wasn't anything he concentrated on maybe he saw to its affairs and stuff and such but he was not out there uh, actively managing the farm as his number one career. Uh, that was just a source of income for him, and he took that money to pursue other interests, uh, uh, which led to him being governor and obviously president. Uh, okay, it, thanks. I, we get the point. Uh, Doug well, well, yes, Jimmy Carter was not a peanut picker. He was an agribusinessman and a very serious one. And you're right, he inherited the business from his father. But he grew up here in Plains or in nearby archery on a farm, and the peanut business was in his blood. He decided he wanted to have a military career, so he, he joined the, 
became a, as we mentioned, a graduate of Annapolis. They went on and uh, served in all over. His, he has, you know, three children. They're each born at different naval bases. One, in a sense, not on the base itself, but one in Groton, one in um, Virginia, one in um, in Hawaii. So he was traveling all over. And then his father died, 53. He came back, and he wanted to take care of the family property and the family business. He came, and the business at that point was fledging and rebuilt it into a very strong business. But Carter, um, so where you're right in the, about the myth of Jimmy Carter, during the campaign in 76, they show these pictures of him shoveling these peanuts in like a Woody Guthrie looking worker's shirt. Those were in many ways staged photographs to present him as a man of the land, a man of the people. But, um, it, but you know, that's just a little bit staged. He knows more about peanuts than just about anybody you can think of. And in many ways, he's like a Henry Wallace who's vice president under Franklin Roosevelt. He's an agriculturalist, Jimmy Carter, and he takes great pride in what I said before about the agricultural waste station outside of town here, always looking at ways, how do you do different crop rotation? How can you get a um, better harvest every year? How old were you in 1976? I was in high school and I had read the book, Why Not the Best? And I was strongly for Jimmy Carter. I couldn't vote um, at that point. So um, my, I was a high school student in, in uh, Ohio. How much time have you spent here in Plains? I spent quite a bit. Um, I've ended up staying at a cabin um, nearby here when I did a lot of research. And I also stayed at a the, uh, motel that used to be the kind of Grand Central Station for the media in America. Months and months and months working on um, another volume on Jimmy Carter, which will cover him from birth here in Plains in 1924 to his winning the White House in 76. Actually, I end with him walking on um, January 77 in the inauguration. Are you the official biographer for Jimmy Carter? Well, I don't like the word official so much, Brian, but I've, um, I've certainly had a, a great deal of access to, to President Carter. He's been, I've been very fortunate in that regard. He's given me a number of interviews here at his home in Plains, uh, where he makes a lot of his own furniture. And um, it's, a, it's a wonderful experience because I can ask him anything. And he's very candid and at one point said, just tell the truth and I'll talk to you on tape. And we, we had a whole series of interviews, including a lot about Plains and his early years here. We talked to Jimmy Carter about two weeks ago up at the Carter Center in Atlanta, and uh, we want to show you just a little bit of this interview where he kind of talks about the, the 1976 campaign. Here's former President Jimmy Carter. The secret to my success, that by secret I mean secret for my opponents, and there were almost a dozen of them, very nice people, was that we had secret uh, campaigns going on. Everybody knew where I was, but at the same day I was campaigning, say, in Iowa, uh, my wife would be in Florida. My mother might be in Maine. My oldest son, Jack, and his wife might be in Pennsylvania. My middle son might be in Wisconsin. Uh, my youngest son might be in California. And my mother's sister, Emily, would be in another state. We had, we had seven campaigns going on simultaneously. We always went back to Plains on the weekend uh, where we could report to each other, this is what I heard in Maine, this is what I heard in Wisconsin. And, and they would, I would make sure that they knew how to answer the basic questions. What are you going to do about this or that? So we had a, a, a team uh, that, that divided during each week, but got together on the weekends to share uh, our experiences and to prepare for the following week. At the same time, once the general election started, uh, of course, Fritz Mondale and I never campaigned together because we had learned then the advantage of being in two places at once at least. And so the only time we ever made a common appearance was in Flint, Michigan, the night before the final vote. So I think we learned some things about politics that, uh, that pay, it certainly paid rich dividends for us. Recorded just a couple weeks ago, Jimmy Carter at his Carter Center up in Atlanta. We are in Plains, Georgia. There are the railroad tracks right along here. And as Doug Brinkley explained, the peanut warehouses down over in this direction. And then right over here is the depot. We're going to learn more about the depot as the morning goes on. We're going to talk to Maxine Reese sitting right over here in just a moment. That was the presidential campaign headquarters and our C-SPAN bus right behind it. Maxine Reese, back there in 1976, what did you have to do with all this? Well, I was the campaign coordinator at the depot. What did that mean? That meant that I took care of uh, any business that was you know, to be carried on at the depot, took care of uh, volunteers who came in every day to um, greet the people as they came, the visitors. Also, um, there, were, there was mail and, and, and all sorts of gifts being sent in here that we had to see about. 
And mainly, we just had a, a great time visiting with people from all over the world how many, as they came through. How, how many people live here? It's about 716 now. How many were there back in 76? 683, so we're growing. <laughs> how many people in this town participated in the Jimmy Carter campaign? I would say um, at least 90% or 95% in some way. Um, they either baked cookies or they um, did interviews or they came down to volunteer or they attended parties. They um, answered questions for the people who were coming in here. Mainly the people who came, come in or who did come into Plains wanted to talk to somebody. They wanted to know about this man that had said that um, he wanted a government as good as the people, that he'd never tell a lie, that he was from this tiny town in Plains, Georgia. And they just wanted to come to see if he was real. What was Miss Lillian like, and what role did she play in all this? <laughs> Miss Lillian was a sweetheart. Um, she came down to the depot every day and would sit in a rocking chair in the back in the freight room and greet the people as they came through. And she would probably walk out on the platform and have a picture made with them. She, was, she did a lot of her campaigning right there in that building. We've got people uh, on the phones. Let's go to Miami, Florida next for a call. We've got Doug Brinkley standing over here. He can also jump in this. Miami, go ahead. Thanks. Uh, my, my question is for Mr. Brinkley. Um, I remember the 1980 campaign really, really well. And I was for uh, President Carter being reelected. I remember he wrote in his memoirs he was happy when Reagan was nominated. He thought he'd be the easiest opponent. At the time, I was working as a human resource director for a unionized factory with very uh, pro-union members, all Democrats. And I watched the Reagan-Carter debate by myself, and I thought Carter did a great job, and Reagan gave bland generalities and that kind of thing. The next day I went to work and I sounded out the men in the plant, and to a man, they were almost all impressed with Reagan. I was shocked. And they were saying nice things about him. And my question is, if, if, he, if uh, Mr. Brinkley thinks maybe the biggest single mistake in retrospect President Carter made was ever agreeing to debate President uh, Reagan, and if not, if there, if there was any single mistake that he made that, you know, he might have been able to turn the 1980 campaign around, or if in retrospect he was just destined to lose that campaign. Thank you very much. Well, I don't think there's much more he, I think he had to have debated Ronald Reagan. Um, I think that that Reagan's genius really at, at making those kind of quips like to Jimmy Carter, there you go again, uh, captured the American people. The hostage crisis really hurt Jimmy Carter a great deal in 1980, but also you had double digit inflation. Um, people weren't happy with the way the economy was going. There was that whole notion of malaise, although President Carter never used the word malaise. So the, pro the, the, the campaign had some problems. And of course, there was the Ted Kennedy challenge. And I think the Kennedy challenge gets to the fundamental problem of 1980 for Jimmy Carter. As president, he had a lot of accomplishments, the Camp David Accords, Panama Canal Treaty, recognizing the People's Republic of China, a, uh, denouncing apartheid, helping the, the peaceful transition of Rhodesia to Zimbabwe. One can go on, his whole human rights policy, which in retrospect looks better, but he was not good at democratic politics. And he, in those four years leading up to that 80 campaign, or, uh, he, he had alienated both the liberal Ted Kennedy wing of his party and the more conservative um, Scoop Jackson wing of the party. So there wasn't a whole lot that he could have done, and he did talk substance. Jimmy Carter's extraordinarily intelligent, uh, and I agree with you that I think in those debates, when it comes to substance, Carter uh, outshined Ronald Reagan, but Reagan had that kind of uh, charm and a wink and a nod and the good one-liners, and um, people after the debates thought that Reagan won. Maxine Reese, mm -hmm. right around us is Billy Carter's gas station over here, and mm -hmm. Cousin Hugh's Antiques, the depot, President Carter's home down the street. What were all these people like? What, were, what was Billy Carter like? Billy Carter was a fine man. He, um, he had a very good sense of humor, finely tuned. And, but he, he loved his family and his community. And uh, I understand his we, wife just opened up another shop yes, right she did. by the depot? she did. She opened up a shop, a, a florist shop. What year did he die? I don't remember. It's been a long time? It's been, it's been several years now. What happened to the gas station? No one's, they don't run anything over there now. Uh, no, right now there's nothing over there. There was a, re a small restaurant over there uh, until recently. What about Jimmy Carter? What did you like about him? Why did you work so hard for him? 
Jimmy Carter uh, has a way of instilling, instilling confidence in you some way or another. I don't know exactly what it is. If he tells you something, you believe it. And when we first moved here, we moved here in 1956, my husband and I, and he came here to teach school. And uh, Jimmy Carter was one of the two that um, interviewed him for his job. At that time, he was over at the uh, peanut warehouse office. The first time I remember seeing Jimmy Carter, he was walking down the street with his khaki pants on and his brogan shoes going to work. And um, we knew that uh, he was a, a working person just like everybody else, and that he knew um, what it was to work for a living. He knew what it was to struggle. And if he said he was going to do something, he did it. Let's take a call. Tracy, California, you're next. Go ahead, please. I have two White House questions. I read in a book by Kessler that Carter was very nitpicky regarding the day-to-day -day functions of the White House staff. Was this true? My second question was, uh, what was Jimmy Carter's favorite room in the White House? Thank you. Doug Brinkley, you want to try that nitpicking question? <laughs> well, sure. Well, you know, um, President Carter was an engineer, and he had an engineer mentality, and he liked to be, he's a very organized person, and punctuality means a lot to him. Hence, he has a reputation of being a micromanager, and there's some degree of truth to that. Um, he liked to, when he ran for state legislator here in Georgia, he said, I'm going to read every piece of paper that crossed my desk, and he did. Well, he tried doing that in the White House, and that's quite difficult. So he spent a lot of time reading things and not delegating. On the other hand, he was a very hands-on president, and when you go to the Carter Library and look at the documents, you could see how mu much Carter was involved with, with the making of things. But it gets exaggerated, this notion that he was spending his time micromanaging the tennis courts gets very blown out of proportion by his enemies. It was not that quite to that kind of extent, but yes, he was hands-on and had a micromanager style, if you'd like. Uh, as for his favorite room, I think it's every president's favorite room, and that's the Oval Office. That's the office that you miss. Uh, that's where policy is made. That's where your great decisions, your greatest triumphs and tribu um, trials and tribulations usually take place um, there. But um, also, you know, he, he would use some of the recreational facilities. I think more than the White House, Jimmy Carter, more than any president, enjoyed Camp David. The woods, you know, he loves hiking and, and, and walking in the woods, and the Camp David retreat became a very special place, and it happened to be the setting for, I think, his biggest presidential accomplishment, the peace accords between Egypt and Israel, which would not have happened if he had not brokered it. Maxine Reese, uh, we, Fred Boyles of the National Park Service was telling me yesterday that he's returned something like 38 of 52 weeks in the last year to teach on Sundays at the Baptist Church over here. Do you go there? I do. What's it like having a former president teach, teach the Bible on Sundays? Well, I think it's quite an experience for the people who come in here to visit, for, us, for the ones of us who live here. It's just a normal everyday occurrence for Jimmy to be teaching Sunday school because he taught Sunday school long before he be became involved in politics. What's the, uh, what goes on here? I mean, now is this a tourist place? Uh, there are tourists here every day, yes. There will always be tourists here. What do people say about this place? What do you hear people say to you after they've seen it? Well, they, they think it's a quaint little town and, and they, they love it. They, they like to walk down the street and talk to the people that are on the street. It just thrills them to be able to talk to somebody that actually knows a president. And um, they, won't, they ask questions about, about Jimmy, and, and um, we answer them to the best of our ability. We have a camera over on a little monument near the depot, <laughs> and there's a picture of a dog on it. Yes. Uh, and it's J. Who. J. Dash Who. What is that? J. Dash Who. One morning I came down to open the campaign headquarters and this half-grown pup ran out from under the depot. We didn't know where she came from or what she was doing there and that seemed to be what people all over the country was thinking. Who was this man that's running for president? And they were saying Jimmy Who. So we just shortened it and called her Jay Who. When did she die? She died um, and um, she lived 10 years so she must have died about uh, 88, 89, somewhere along there. Let's go to Charlotte, North Carolina for our next call. Good morning. Go ahead, please. Hey, good morning. Uh, I'll start with a story and end up with a question. Um, you, you spoke of uh, Mr. Lillian and the train depot. I was nine years old and visited Plains with my parents uh, to see the, the campaign in full swing on our way to Florida. And uh, I ran across this picture now 23 years later 
of Miss Lillian in the rocker on the front porch with her signature on it. And um, as, a, as a grown man now, uh, I decided to use this as a training event and ride back to Plains and to see that train depot again. So I rode my bike from Columbia, South Carolina to Plains, Georgia and back just to see the train depot and see the town again. Why, why did you do all that and what impact did it have on you when you rode your bike all the way from Columbia, South Carolina? Let me tell you, seeing that train depot just really uh, brought back everything I remembered uh, from the childhood, from, from my family and for seeing Jimmy Carter run for president and all the significant features that it's had on my life. And it just was just fantastic to see it again and to see the same people and to uh, to go in the same store and to see the, the same, essentially the same postcards in a, in a lot of ways. And it was really fantastic. But the height of it all was that as I was buying my souvenir postcards and peanuts and talking to people on the street, the, the Carters drove up and had, a, had lunch there in town and had the chance to meet President Carter and, and Roslyn and and I believe her mother and, and Jerry Smith, and she is exactly right. It's a, it's a wonderful place, and um, it's, a, it's a place that tourists will always go to, and I think more and more people, and as we look at Jimmy Carter, the man, will be back to Plains to, to revisit what, what he has stood for. And um, my other question, uh, thanks for letting me share the story because it was a wonderful experience for me, and um, I'm glad to see you there. And uh, my question would be if... if uh, or Brinkley would be if, if Carter's vision of conservation and us conserving uh, a gallon of fuel uh, every day or, or whatever he had said in his, his speech, that if his vision of conservation had, had really been taken hold and, and we lived it today, where would where do you think we'd be? Would be we'd be better off? And thanks for being there. Thank you very much for the call. Doug Brinkley, did you get well, all that? Yes, well, the, um, it's a good question. And Jimmy Carter is a conservationist in the truest sense. As governor, he did so much to conserve resources here in Georgia. And that's kind of sense of frugality, the sense of not wanting to waste things. Uh, in many ways, it was, it was ridicule when he was president, kind of the, the Christmas trees, lights off, you know, or the lights off during Christmas season got laughed at. But what he was trying to tell us as president was that we are 6% of the world's population using 35% of the world's nat um, natural resources here in the United States, and we have to be careful with our waste. So I've always found that an admirable side of him. Also, as an environmentalist, Jimmy Carter was really quite strong as president. And one of his greatest legacies, he says, after the Camp David Accords, the other thing he's the proudest of is the Alaska Lands Act, which uh, land about three sizes of the size of California was preserved through national monuments, forest lands, largely in Alaska. Um, in his, uh, the, the last days of his presidency, actually in December 1980, it's one of the great environmental landmark bills that people don't realize President Carter uh, took part in. As ex-president, and throughout his whole life, he fishes, um, he hunts, he camps, and is somebody who really is in tune with the outdoors and wants to uh, make sure that we don't waste our, our natural resources. Now, Maxine Reese, right behind Doug Brinkley, and I'm going to ask him also about is that pink house over there. Yeah, yes. Who owns that house now? Um, Grace Jackson did own it, but she's recently sold it. I'm not sure the name of the lady uh, the, who owns it, but it's a bed and breakfast now. But I'm anxious to ask Doug Brinkley because I know he wants to tell the story. What's special about that house, uh, Professor Brinkley? <laughs> well, the, the pink house is a bed and breakfast now, but there's a plaque inside if you go upstairs, and it's the house that President Carter was conceived in. It's the, the, the place where Mr. Earl and Ms. Lillian lived in 1924 when um, she became pregnant and um, gave birth to Jimmy Carter at a hospital just down the road here, uh, maybe a half a mile away. And it's a trivia question. Jimmy Carter, who is the first president born in a hospital? And the answer is Jimmy Carter at a very small hospital just down the road here. It's, you wouldn't even call it a hospital by today's standards. Maxine Reese, I'm going to move on, but one last quick question for you. Uh -huh. What was the biggest memory you have from the 1976 campaign? I guess the biggest memory would be election night, when the town was just completely full of people from everywhere, from all over the country. Um, that's one. And then the next one would probably be when Jimmy came home after he had lost the election and we had a welcome home farm here in Main Street. It was the outpouring of love of all the people. It's, it was just amazing. And, and I'll never forget the numbers that came. It was, um, it was a sad time that last time when he came home after he was defeated. But election night was jubilant. Now, when people come here, can they meet you? Are you around? I'm always around. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good to see you. <laughs> Let's take a call as I walk over to Doug Brinkley from Crowley, Texas. Crowley, go ahead, please. Yes, 
Yes, the thing that I remember uh, about Jimmy Carter's time is that we had fuel lines, and of course, there was the hostages and the double uh, uh, inflation we had. And I believe that Jimmy Carter was the first uh, what what would be called now the religious right. But of course, he wasn't. He because he was a Democrat, he was not. Uh, uh, referred to as right wing as what we hear today, and but as I look back and read Jimmy Carter's books, and I have read most of them that he has written, he's very religious right, and uh, uh, but we we don't hear him referred that way, uh, uh, be, because I feel like that that. Uh, he's a Democrat, and they're not referred to as religious right, which Jimmy Carter actually is. Okay, thanks. I disagree with you completely. Um, Jimmy Carter is not on the religious right. He's a Christian, and uh, that does not mean because you have a Christian that you're naturally with the religious right. Jimmy Carter is about tolerance, about tolerance of all sorts of religions, about all sorts of people. There's no intolerance to him. He's not saying Christians are the only ones. He's admired in all over the world, and particularly Japan, China, places that don't um, have Christianity. It is true that he is somebody who has a born again, believes very strong, uh, and he uh, believes very strongly in Jesus Christ, and it's been a big, big part of his life. I want, uh, for those who've just tuned in, I want to ask Linwood to, if he can swing his camera around and kind of give us a, an overview of where we are once again in Plains, Georgia, and as I said, 150 miles south of Atlanta. On Route 280, it's a federal highway and also the state highway. I guess 45 comes through here also. Um, if people come to visit here, and if you're my age, you remember the 76 campaign and all the networks were here and this was a sound, sound stage for the campaign, what can you see in this location? Well, you see, it's, it's like a little micro set of Jimmy Carter's life. I mentioned the house that he was conceived in down the road is the house that he lives in now. You go down the road further, about 10 miles, and you see his boyhood home where there were sharecroppers and the, and the, the fields that are there. You've got the whole campaign headquarters, which you mentioned, at the depots here. You have the school, which is now made into a museum where Julia Coleman became his mentor and meant a great deal to him, and you can tour the school. You can go to the church. Marinara, the um, Baptist church where he holds Sunday school classes and teaches. You can see a big giant peanut, uh, plastic peanut over a gas station as you enter town, an old kind of roadside remnant from the 76 campaign. You can meet people like Maxine Reese, peanut brigaders, kinfolk to Jimmy Carter. Um, so it's a very real experience to come here. And of course, right across the street, you have Billy Carter's uh, gas station. So you can see that site. We have a call for, local call from Plains, Georgia. Go ahead, Plains. You're on the air. Hey, my name is Lee Shoemake. I'm with the Beta Club at Sumner County Comprehensive High School. And my question was, what type of student was Jimmy Carter in high school and at the academy? And who does he feel was most influential to him during his youth? Do you know much about Jimmy Carter yourself? Uh, not really, no, sir. Do you live, you live right in here in Plains or close by? Uh, actually, I live in Leslie. We're just here from the school to uh, visit and wander around. Just okay, thanks. Well, Jimmy Carter's nickname was Hot for Hot Shot um, because he was so bright and um, ambitious, smart, hardworking. He was a model student, and it's, um, you know, his teachers would tell you that. Uh, he did get into some bits of mischief and some bits of trouble, but he was a first-rate student. He used to say that he read War and Peace of Tolstoy by the time he was 12 years old. Some people used to dispute whether he really could have done that, but he used to say that he did. At Annapolis, he, he was terrific there. Um, he was, as I said, at one of the you know, top part of his class, number 89 there at Annapolis, and went on to be, work in the nuclear sub-program of Admiral Rickover. Heroes, his father, Mr. Earl, was back as a boy and is today. And many people focus on Ms. Lillian because she was such a colorful and wonderful character, but his father was his hero. And then, without a shadow of a doubt, Admiral Rickover, and if you were to take presidents, Jimmy Carter's favorite president is Herbert, or is, is um, Harry S. Truman, who he admires because of his frankness and candor, and Woodrow Wilson. Dallas, Texas, you're next. Go ahead, please. Uh, yes, uh, I'm glad to call you. Uh, I've always watched C-SPAN. It's first time caller. And uh, I have a lot of respect for Jimmy Carter. But the reason I think he lost the election to uh, Ronald Reagan was because... Um, 
Reagan came in with uh, lower taxes for the average uh, uh, person. And I think uh, today we're seeing the same thing with uh, uh, George W. Bush uh, basically saying the same thing about lower taxes. Okay, thanks. Let me, before you answer that, point out, and you can add the, the correct figures, but Jimmy Carter in 1976 beat Gerald Ford 40 million to 39 million, roughly. But then, four years later, he lost 43 million by Ronald Reagan to 35 million for himself. He lost 5 million votes. What yes. happened? Well, people were disenchanted with those four years, largely for what our callers saying, for economic reasons, um, because of the double-digit inflation, because of the difficulty of getting a job, because of the, the energy crisis, because of the way he, he handled the um, hostage crisis. There were a lot. It was, he was not seen as being a leader of his party. And I, again, you know, it's sometimes not your enemies you have to worry about, it's your friends. And I don't think in the Democratic Party ever rallied around Carter. But think of this, Brian. He came in to office at one point in 77 saying the Democratic Party is an albatross around my neck. He came in as the outsider and wanted to refashion the party and it was it, it turned out that he couldn't do it so he lost a lot of people in his own own party who didn't really get behind him the way they did in 76. The peanut brigade was great in 76 in 80 they it, it failed. The sun is coming up right over here over these buildings but it's hard to see this. Our, our cameras are going to pick this up. This is a monument that says Plains Honors her own Jimmy Carter, 39th President of the United States, 1977 to 1981. And then over here on the right, it, it lists his accomplishments in politics. The Sumter County School Board, 1955-1962. Member of the Georgia Senate, 63-67. Governor of Georgia, 71-75. President of the United States, 77 to 81. How controversial was his time on the Sumter County School Board? Fairly controversial. Remember, just that date should jump out at you. 1955 is a year after Brown versus Topeka Board of Education ending uh, separate but equal, the Supreme Court ruling. And so all through the South, there was a panic and white citizens councils grew. 55 is the year of the Montgomery bus boycott. Carter came in the school board and basically, since he had lived in the Navy, an integrated Navy, he came back to Plains, a segregated town, and said, we have to integrate our schools. So he fought very strongly to, to uphold the law and was often, went head to head in clashes with the White Citizens Councils. To one point at that warehouse there, the White Citizens Councils wanted him to stop selling um, peanuts or any goods to the blacks in this area. Carter refused and took money. They were trying to bribe him to not sell the blacks and Carter flushed it down the toilet in a kind of heroic moment of standing up for, for um, you know, Brown. He was never a civil rights warrior, but he believed in upholding the law, and, and, and he did that as in the board of, you know, education board. As we go, one of the quotes over here is, America did not invent human rights. Human rights invented America. That's January 14th, 1981. Let's go over to the depot, and as we walk, we'll take a call from Savannah, Georgia. Savannah, you're on the air. Go ahead, please. Oh, thank you. Um, I have two comments and then one question from Mr. Brinkley. Uh, one, Mr. Brinkley, I think, hit the nail on the head. The Democratic Party just, I think, despised Carter, and, and uh, really are the reasons that he wasn't reelected. Uh, two, I'd recommend anybody, if they can, if they can find a copy of it, to pick up uh, Billy Carter's autobiography. It's it's quite an inspirational book. Um, the third, and which is my question, um, Mr. Brinkley. With Carter being in the nuclear navy and a, and a, and a student of of Rickover, was it just the aftermath of the Vietnam War that the military was so drawn down that you know when you mentioned if he'd had two more helicopters he might have been able to pull off, uh, I, you know from everything I've read and I've never heard it addressed, uh, you know the military just been so drawn down uh, I don't think they could have ever accomplished that mission. Well, the, um, as I mentioned before, President Carter is a military person, and he not only did he go to Annapolis and have this long career in the Navy, I think it's, it's a misnomer that Jimmy Carter was weak on defense. Um, it, certainly, he wanted to continue the detente of Nixon with the Soviet Union, and certainly there was a, but his human rights policy as president was aimed at the Soviet Union, and now we know that the, you know, there are 112,000 or so um, Jews who left the Soviet Union under Jimmy Carter's human rights policy, that the Carter administration which would have translations of Solzhenitsyn's works, um, of, of the Bible all through Eastern Europe and Russia through the CIA, that there was a offensive spirit to Jimmy Carter's um, to human rights policy of, of breaking the back of the Soviet Union. And if you talk to people like Havel 
or, or if, if, if you talk to Sakharov or if you talk to Lech Walesa, they think of Jimmy Carter's human rights policy as what gave them this great sense of liberation in many ways. Keep this in mind, in 1980, Jimmy Carter wanted to raise the defense budget by 5%. Reagan by 7%. That was the difference. And much of the, the whether it's the stealth bomber or, 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 you know, you can go on and on with n new technology in the military came under Harold Brown and Jimmy Carter. So it's been kind of a myth that Carter was sort of weak on defense. But it is true, he did want to cut some defense spending and, and do away with antiquated and wasteful spending. But Carter was that way across the board. He didn't like the idea of that, you know, $50,000 hammer and was trying to get control over it. And I think he's been miscast as somehow being weak on defense when he, he was, at least by the last year after the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, Brzezinski, Brown, and Carter were extremely hawkish against the Soviet Union. We got some video from 1980 around that rescue attempt over in Iran. Let's, uh, let's take a look at that and then we'll come back when you're going to meet Fred Boyles in just a moment, who's the superintendent of this site for the National Park Service. Late yesterday, I canceled a carefully planned operation which was underway in Iran to position our rescue team for a later withdrawal of American hostages who have been held captive there since November 4th. Equipment failure in the rescue helicopters made it necessary to end the mission. As our team was withdrawing after my order to do so, two of our American aircraft collided on the ground following a refueling operation in a remote desert location in Iran. Other information about this rescue mission will be made available to the American people when it is appropriate to do so. There was no fighting, there was no combat, but to my deep regret, eight of the crewmen of the two aircraft which collided were killed and several other Americans were hurt in the accident. Our people were immediately airlifted from Iran. Those who were injured have gotten medical treatment and all of them are expected to recover. No knowledge of this operation by any Iranian officials or authorities was evident to us until several hours after all Americans were withdrawn from Iran. Our rescue team knew, and I knew, that the operation was certain to be difficult, and it was certain to be dangerous. We were all convinced that if and when the rescue operation had been commenced, that it had an excellent chance of success. We're standing here in front of the depot, the Jimmy Carter presidential campaign headquarters from 1976. Our school bus is right behind that. We want to remind teachers, as we try to do from time to time, that if you're interested in becoming a part of C-SPAN in the classroom, we have a telephone number for you to call. It's a free service, a chance for you to sign up and get material that you can use in the classroom. We're going to rerun this series in its entirety starting December the 20th. Get the material at 202-626-4858. This is for teachers who have classrooms and students and people that you teach, uh, homeschoolers, cspan.org slash classroom. You can get to us on the internet. Call at 202-626-4858 now as we're standing in Plains, Georgia. And is Doug Brinkley, if you look over there and all these shops that are here on that main street that we've seen so much in the news, who of all the people that were in those buildings over there would you like to meet and have you did you have a chance to talk to Hugh Carter for instance? I did I used to talk to Hugh Carter quite a bit because I'd park here in town and he'd be a fountain of information to point you to a different person most people you want when you want to do oral histories like I've done in this whole area they're in the phone book and you know one person knows you're in town here everybody knows you're in town here it really is a small town Carter used to say you know that I'm honest and I have no skeletons in my closet because everybody in Plains knows what everybody else has done in their life. You can't hide anything in a town this small, and I think that's true. I would have liked to have met Ms. Lillian. She died before I got a chance to meet her. I learned to admire her a great deal. And incidentally, because I, it's not proven for sure, but they used to spray the fields here with insecticides, and both Mr. Carter, Earl Carter, died of pancreatic cancer, Ms. Lillian, Billy, um, you know, his sister um, Gloria, um, Ruth, it was sort of a hit the whole family, pancreatic cancer. And 
They are all buried out here in this small cemetery? Yes, and on Gloria, Jimmy Carter's um, young, younger sister, she was a motorcycle rider, and she used to ride a Harley and go around with sort of like Hell's Angels-like group, and on her tombstone it says, may she live something to the degree, may she live forever in Harley heaven. And at her funeral, there was this great Harley procession here in town. And of course, Billy Carter has always been a great presence here in town. And again, he was not a buffoon. Um, he was a really bright, funny guy. How many Supreme Court justices did he appoint? How many did Carter appoint? Boy, now you're going to be, uh, I can't think right now. I don't want to say the wrong, the wrong thing. Let's go to McHenry, Illinois. You're on the air. Go ahead, please. Yes. Uh, first of all, Mr. Lamb, I want to thank you for your program. It's very enlightening, and we enjoy it a lot. Uh, Mr. Brinkley, could you comment somewhat on the the uh, decision-making process uh, in as much as the Panama Canal is in the news a little bit now, the thought process that went into Mr. Carter's decision to, to transfer the control of the canal? Thanks. Well, the canal, the issue of what to do with the canal in Panama really was a big issue with Lyndon Johnson. Uh, it did not become quite as big of an issue, but it was also with Nixon and Kissinger. So in many ways, it was, a, a, like everything, a problem he inherited. Carter put everything he could into it, and many people think it was one of his great, it was one of his, his most people consider it a great success. It passed by a single vote, but he had a lobby on the Hill so desperately to get that passed, and many people thought he should have waited for a while on that. He kind of burned out a lot of people by pushing the canal treaties through. But from Carter's perspective, that had to happen for hemispheric relations. And what's interesting, the book I wrote is called The Unfinished Presidency. And without the Panama Canal Treaties, Carter would not quite have the same role he had in Panama in his post-presidency when he monitored the election there in 1989 and denounced Manuel Noriega as being a thug and, and running a dishonest election. And he was believed throughout the whole hemisphere because of he was the president who, from a Latin American perspective, um, did the right thing with Panama. Of course, it's very contentious, and many Republicans think that the um, it's one of it's a, a horrible thing that Carter did was the canal giveaway they call it. We go to Fred Boyles in a moment. This this call first, East Bend, North Carolina. Go ahead, please. Now, uh, this uh, going back to the uh, Carter Reagan debate. Uh, I understand that George Will was working with Carter, and he stole Carter's briefing papers, and that gave him a tremendous advantage in the debate. Uh, he went, took those papers back and. And, and worked with with Reagan on that. Uh, would you, you that, comment uh, on that, uh, you meant that, Mr. Brinkley? You meant that George Will was working with Ronald Reagan instead right. of Jimmy Carter. Well, that's a famous story, and I got an opportunity to talk to George Will about that. He he, he denies it, that he, but he said Jimmy Carter's still angry at him for it. And that story was that he actually got a hold of the Carter briefing booklet and in advance and um, stole it is, the, is what happened, but Will denies it. But then went on TV and made commentary on the debates and not recognizing his true role with the Reagan team and his role in that. So from a Carter person's perspective, a Democrat's perspective, Will's something of a rap on that situation. From Will's perspective, it's just sour, sour grapes because um, you know Carter didn't do well in the debate. I, I should tell the audience that if you can see behind the depot, the school bus, that in direct way Doug Brinkley was responsible for that because he appeared on book notes with his book The Magic Bus and we got our idea to have a school bus going around the United States from Mr. Brinkley who is a professor a professor at the University of New Orleans right now runs the Eisenhower Center and has several books out including the book Unfinished Presidency about Jimmy Carter it's in paperback but what's the history book that people can find now in the stores well I wrote a book called the American Heritage History of the United States which is the whole history of the country and then this Christmas season Steve Ambrose and I co-edited a book called Witness to America which is a uh, eyewitness accounts we updated a Henry Steele commenter Alan Nevins book brought it up so it, it, instead of just writing about the Boston Tea Party we, there's an excerpt of somebody who participated in dumping the tea instead of talking about Lindbergh's flight we include from we the book by Lindbergh what it was like to have been in the the cockpit while he flew flight and first saw the Eiffel Tower what the World War II is like from a soldier's perspective, on and on, sort of first-person eyewitness accounts called Witness to America. As we stand in the middle of the plains, there's a lot of traffic around us. You hear the noise. There are trucks, main thoroughfare here. And uh, if you've just joined us, again, we'll say that we're about two and a half hours south of Atlanta, about 150 miles, depending on how fast you are pushing your foot on the accelerator. You know, one thing that's interesting, Brian, down this road, past the house where Jimmy Carter lives today, 
his home, keep on going down in that direction. And there's a place called Konania Farms, which was an integrated racial community. And that's where Habitat for Humanity grew out of. It's from right there down the road from him. And it used to be a place where black and whites lived together, worked together, worshiped together. And now Habitat's headquartered in America. So it's not part of the Carter Center. It's based right here, the whole Habitat idea. Next, we want to introduce you to a C-SPAN junkie and superintendent of this site, Fred Boyles. He's over in the high school. Mr. Boyles, good morning. What are, what are you going to talk about over there? Good morning, Brian. Uh, welcome to the Jimmy Carter National Historic Site and to Plains High School, where both President and Mrs. Carter attended all of their public schooling. Uh, this building was built in 1921, and actually Mrs. Carter's mother was one of the first graduates from here, and the school operated until 1979. A lot of our visitors will ask us, well, was this the classroom that Jimmy Carter uh, attended? And of course, the answer is he, had, he, he went to school in all these classrooms uh, because he went to, from grades 1 through 11. Georgia did not have a 12th grade at that time and uh, attended all of his school here at this uh, wonderful old building. What is this building right now? Is he still teaching in that building? Uh, Plains High School? Yeah. It is, uh, it's our museum and visitor center where we meet and greet the public and uh, expose them to the Carter story and especially to the Plains story. To, to understand Jimmy Carter, you need to understand Plains, as Doug Brinkley has already said. And uh, we have a wonderful film in here narrated by Charles Corralt. Uh, we have a, a, a short video film of the Carters giving you a tour of their home and you learn a lot about their personal lives and and how they interact together by watching that film and, and about uh, the house which is very much reflects their personality and uh, who they are as a couple and as a family. How long have you been superintendent here? Right at 10 years. And if people come to visit, how many things are, are operated by the National Park Service? We have four sites uh, here at the Carter site. There is uh, Plains High School. Uh, there's the, the train depot where you are close to where you are now. Uh, we also have the Boyhood Farm, which we are res in the process of restoring and should have that open to the public uh, in about a year where you can learn about those formative years when Jimmy Carter's character was nurtured uh, growing up on uh, this rural farm. And finally, we own the Carter residence uh, where the Carters live today, the house that they built in 1961. And uh, they still, uh, they have a life estate agreement to, to live there until their death. Uh, and it's essentially the same agreement that the Park Service has had with the, the Trumans, the Eisenhowers, and the Johnsons. We're going to let you move to another room while we take a phone call here from Las Vegas, uh, Fred Boyles. Go ahead, Las Vegas. You're on the air. Yeah, hi. I was, uh, during the Carter administration, I bought a house about two years before he was elected at 9.9 .9 interest rate, and I worked in an oil refinery. And uh, like that other lady was talking about, all our tanks were full at the time. I can understand why the prices were so high. But anyway, the refinery closed, and I had to uh, sell my house, and the interest rates were 25%. I was just wondering why that happened. Doug Brinkley? Well, it, I think your, your memory back then is why a lot of people will always consider the Carter years uh, um, uh, of a time of not happiness in many ways. Uh, the, you know, but the economy is a very tricky thing, and what does one give precedence credit for when the economy is good and not when it's bad? I guess we do, but I'm not sure there was that much that Jimmy Carter could have done during that period. He was in, in, inherited an inflationary time. You remember Gerald Ford had the whip inflation now buttons, and uh, nothing seemed to improve with the economy while he was president. Could he have done something more? I don't know, um, you know, but it, he, I know it was something that was a constant concern for him all these years, and I think it's one of the reasons why he'll, he'll never be considered an um, outstanding president by a lot of people is, even though he, he, I think he was in foreign affairs domestically with the economy like that, it's, it, it's the memory people have. Uh, John Updike writes about it in his rabbit books, the kind of despair with the gasoline lines, you know, going blocks long and that double-digit um, inflation. We go next to Hollywood, Florida, as uh, Fred Boyles goes over to the museum. We'll talk to him in just a second. Go ahead, uh, Hollywood, California. Good morning. Uh, you know, we haven't heard from Springfield, New Jersey yet. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, it's been a long way into the program. <laughs> we haven't heard from him. Go ahead. Um, I was wondering, I remember in the early part of the Carter administration that my memory is that Jimmy Carter 
reached out a lot of times to Ted Kennedy, it seemed to me. But about halfway through the administration, there seemed to be some sort of conflict. Is there anything we don't know about? Was there was there any specific issue that kind of divided them or, or separated them? Uh, made Ted Kennedy run against him in 1980? And, and Ted Kennedy came really close to beating him. As I recall, it was the very last day of the primaries when, when Jimmy Carter um, edged ahead of him. Thanks, Hollywood. Well, keep in mind, um, you know, Ted Kennedy was, many people thought would be president. And here it is, 1976, and he's not president. Chappaquiddick was haunting him. Jimmy Carter is. And there was a bit of arrogance on the Carter's team when they got into the White House, meaning Ham Jordan would take calls from Ted Kennedy. They said, well, you can wait. You know, there was not, they, they loved kind of sticking it into Ted Kennedy some. They, these were a, a group of Southerners. And, you know, the Kennedys were somebody that they, although Ms. Lillian was a great supporter of John F. Kennedy and, and Bobby Kennedy, they, they, there was animosity there. There was never a good relationship, and it just got worse and worse and worse. And I think in 1980, Senator Kennedy, who's been an excellent senator, made a very, very bad decision to challenge Jimmy Carter. It hurt the Democratic Party, and it certainly hurt Carter. Going to meet Leo Rebuffo in a moment, a history professor at George Washington University who takes a little bit different view of Jimmy Carter. But first, Fred Boyles, where are you now? Well, I'm in the uh, museum or the exhibit sections of Plains High School, and the exhibits are divided into three eras, and they're the three eras that uh, Jimmy Carter uh, has lived in Plains. Era one, growing up. Era two, his middle years before he really entered into national politics. And then era three, what he's often called his forced retirement from government service, his post-presidency. Of all the things that you talk about here on these tours, what interests you the most? Uh, that's hard to say. I, I think uh, Jimmy Carter's early years when he was growing up, going to school here at Plains High School, uh, living on the farm, uh, interacting with his uh, friends who were mostly black, uh, growing up in, in archery, which is about two miles uh, west of here. Uh, I think this school is a marvelous place. Our visitors come here and they say, that, gee, this is just like the school I went to in Oregon or Ohio or Texas uh, because it's uh, very typical of schools all over the country, many of which are obsolete now and, and uh, no longer used and fallen into a state of disrepair. Is there anything you can show us in this room? Yes, uh, this is a panel here that was done on, uh, on the school. Uh, every day uh, at Plains High School, uh, the school day would start with morning chapel and they would sing from uh, uh, hymns and songs from 101 best songs and uh, all of the students would sit in the auditorium uh, where our visitors are sitting right now and they would sit in, in seats uh, based on their grade level and uh, there would be some announcements, uh, some prayers, scripture reading, maybe some, uh, uh, some student who had written a poem uh, would read it and uh, then there, uh, Miss Julia Coleman, who was the superintendent of the school, would ring the bell, and the school day would start. Take a call while you move to the other side there. We go to Sampson, Alabama. Go ahead, please. You're on the air. Uh, good morning. I'm a high school senior, and Mr. Carter has long been my, my hero. But I, like, I visited Plains uh, September 26th this year, and I had the honor of meeting President Carter. It was a very, I uh, seen him at his Sunday school. And I became even more convinced that he was the president who truly cared about people, and, and I really appreciate everything he does. But what I'd like to ask Mr. Brinkley is, um, in recent um, presidential greatness surveys, President Carter's lingered somewhere around 25. Um, but according to public opinion polls right now, he's probably the most admired living president as of now. Do you think uh, history will... will, uh, will uh, look kindly upon him. How do you see this, sir? Thank you. So, excellent question. Um, one thing to keep in mind, I look at Jimmy Carter as a great American figure. You just don't look at the presidency. You have to look at what he's done in the post-presidency. But we're here in Plains right now. He's in Mozambique monitoring election there right now. And he's been, he's all over the world working as that, that um, plaque we just saw talked about human rights. He's everywhere um, campaigning for human rights to eradicate guinea worm disease in Africa, river blindness, campaign elections. It's this extraordinary ex-presidency. So I do think he's going up in people's estimate as a person. And they're mixing the presidency with the ex-presidency together. I think in those polls when historians are being told to ask just about the presidency is why you're getting the, the lower points. If you have to say, what do you think of Jimmy Carter as a person? 
he's, he's very high today. In fact, he's number one when it comes to issues of character and morality. Fred Boyles, what else do you have for us? Well, we're here uh, back at Plains High School in the, uh, in the school exhibit, and uh, there's a remarkable picture here of Jimmy Carter uh, with an, a number of other students at the front steps of Plains High School on George Washington's birthday. And he's holding the American flag here. He's a young teenager. And uh, uh, the, the theme of the day was uh, building leaders for today and tomorrow. I think it's uh, uh, tremendously ironic that here was, here was this future president uh, remembering the, the first president of the United States. Fred Boyles, how many folks do you have working for you to keep this site going? There's about 11 of us uh, that work here, and several of us, myself included, uh, share our time between Andersonville National Historic Site. Uh, the Park Service has done this in many parks to uh, help be better stewards of the taxpayers' money and to, to make uh, efficient services that, uh, so that we can provide the best service to the public, but also do it at the uh, lowest possible cost. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for your hospitality. We're going to uh, move on with calls and set up uh, Leo Rabuffo, who's right over in the other room. And uh, we are go next to Manhattan, Kansas. Go ahead, please. You're on the air. Uh, yes, I'd like to make a couple comments. First of all, uh, on the taxes, all of them say they're not going to raise taxes, and they all do. And I would like to also uh, point out about the inflation. Uh, it was in such a shape that nobody could have got us out of that mess. And it's still in bad shape, I think, even though they say it's in good shape. And I remember presidents from way back as far as Truman. And okay, it, thanks. Let's go to Columbus, Georgia next. You're on the air with Doug Brinkley. Go ahead, please. Yes, sir. I just wanted to compliment your program. I grew up in America, so about 10 miles away, and I was 16 years old when President Carter was elected. Um, Doug Brinkley has an incredible knowledge of Jimmy Carter and, and the Plains area. And you all had a question about... Uh, how many justices to the Supreme Court Jimmy Carter nominated, and the answer is zero. Yeah, that's right. Thanks. Why didn't he have justices? What was it? You no, no, the circumstances? Yeah, just nobody was up. I was trying to, when you asked me, you threw me off there, and I was trying to think about in 1980 if there was somebody, and, and the answer is zero. So it was not, not a time there was somebody, you know, up for it. Would you tell the story of what happened back in 1976 with the Plains Baptist Church and Jimmy Carter? Ah, okay. Um, well, we have got to keep in mind that this is the South. We're in the Deep South, and it's been a it's a it was segregated throughout its time. Jim Crow still lived, and even in '76, of course, you, you would think the Civil Rights Acts changed things, but there was still a great deal of segregation. Plains Baptist Church was a um, segregated um, church, and it, Jimmy Carter was um, had been attending there, and so he during the campaign this became an issue. And so President Carter bolted that church, and they created the new church where he's at now. Um, so it became a great controversy here that the, the church became a symbol for segregation in this community in general. And here's President Carter, some people would say, talking about courting the African-American vote, yet he takes part in a sense of in a, in a segregated plains, which was segregated like all the southern communities. So it's that point in time in 76 where a lot of these issues, the, the post-Civil Rights Acts of Lyndon Johnson were being fleshed out in the South, and um, it became a, a mini-scandal for Jimmy Carter on his march to the White House. Tishmingo, Oklahoma, for Doug Brinkley. Go ahead, please. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I sure enjoyed your program. I watch you all the time, and this, I'm a first-time caller. And uh, I'd just like to say that uh, I didn't vote for Mr. Carter in 1980. That was the first time I could vote. And I wish I had voted for him, because I think he'll go down as one of the best presidents and honest presidents that we ever had. And I made more money while he was president than, <laughs> than I ever had. <laughs> well, All right, thanks. Let's go to Worthington, Minnesota. Go ahead, please. You're on the air. Yes, this is Fern Anderson from Worthington, Minnesota. Um, we thank you for uh, your C-SPAN series. We've enjoyed it very much. And my husband and I have been privileged to visit Plains, Georgia twice and to attend Jimmy Carter's Sunday School class and then had our picture taken with Jimmy Carter and his wife, Rosalind. My question is, prior to becoming president, Carter was governor of Georgia, but he never held a national office. Do you think that is what made it difficult for him to get effective legislation passed? 
Hold on to that thought, uh, Doug Brinkley. I want to ask her a question okay. about coming here and going to the Baptist Church. What was the experience like? What was it like hearing Jimmy Carter teach religion uh, there on, on your visit to Plains? It was a very uh, inspiring uh, visit that we had. And uh, we also uh, sat right behind President Carter and Rosalind in the church service and had them greet us afterwards. And uh, uh, his uh, teaching was from the book of Galatians at the time, and uh, we felt that he did a, a very good job of, of giving out the information about uh, Galatians. Thank you. Your thoughts? I would just add to that, you know, when you go to the church, there, he, some of the collection bowl, you'll see JC, the initials on, and he makes so many things right down the road here. He's a carpenter's shed where he makes a lot of things. And there used to be, some of his speech writers used to tease him about the initials JC equaling Jesus Christ, uh, and not in a teasing way in many ways, but you see the JC on a lot of the wooden objects. And he gives, makes things and gives them to people um, as gifts all around. What about the governor thing? Um, he was a one-term governor of Georgia. Remember, Bill Clinton's a five-time governor of Arkansas. So, and I think she's absolutely right. But what happened was, in a, I don't have the time to tell the full story, but when he made his announcement as governor, he had Lester Maddox, the arch segregate, when he won the, at his inaugural, he had Lester Maddox, the arch segregationist, behind him. And Carter addressed Georgia and said, the time to end racial segregation in the South is upon us now. And he made the cover of Time magazine because of that speech, which says, Dixie whistles a new tune that ran in January of 1971. Up in New York, David Rockefeller saw that, uh, him on the cover, and put Jimmy Carter as the lone Southerner governor on the Trilateral Commission, which is the so-called Eastern Establishment, and, and Trilateral deals with Western Europe, Japan, and U.S. trade. So that's how Carter got his, if you'd like, national credentials by meeting all the people through Trilateral, but the caller's correct. I think it hurt him as an outside governor coming in Washington, not understanding fully the D.C. game. If you just joined us, we're in Plains, Georgia, and we're standing in front of the depot. Those of you who are old enough to remember, this was kind of a sound stage for the networks and the press back in the 1976 election. The stores all along here, belonging, many of them, to the Carter family, the peanut warehouse down at the other end of the street, the railroad tracks here, Route 280, on its way to Americus, Georgia, which is only 10 miles away. And we're going to meet Leo Rebuffo in a second, this call, and then we'll go to Professor Rebuffo, Worthington, Minnesota. We had that one. Let's go to Seattle, Washington. Seattle, you're next. Are you there, Seattle? Yes, I'm here. Go ahead. Uh, well, uh, Brian, I heard your interview with uh, President Carter, and uh, the one, the things that he said that he couldn't influence was the energy and the banking. And I believe his defeat in 1980 was orchestrated by those that are in power in the banking and the energy and I believe I can back that up with the statement that when when uh, uh, Reagan uh, became president his secretary of state was uh, was Schultz who was the vice president of Bechtel Corporation who pretty much runs the oil industry Seattle, bank. thanks. I think we got the point. I want to ask Leo Rebuffo if he was listening to that, whether he agrees with that man's analysis. Uh, no, I don't. I think what we have to remember is the late 70s were very complicated times uh, worldwide, and Carter was caught in world historical circumstances. Uh, the rise in price of primary products, particularly petroleum, the rise of religious nationalism, and there's a great deal of continuity in what afflicted the Nixon, Ford, and Carter administrations in terms of the, of the economy. Uh, Carter and his advisors knew perfectly well they could defeat inflation if they were willing to accept, say, 10, 11 percent unemployment. But even if Carter was a new kind of Democrat, he was enough of a Democrat who didn't want the working class and the poor to take that hit, as they ultimately would under Reagan. Leo Rebuffo is over in the high school. He's a George Washington University professor in Washington, D.C. What, at what point in your process of writing a book about Jimmy Carter are you? Uh, I would say the researching is about 80% done and the writing maybe 25% done. It's a focus on the presidency, uh, much less on the biography. I think there's a tendency to emphasize Carter's P and pre- and post-presidency as pleasant times, but the presidency, like all presidencies, is quite significant. As one of the callers pointed out, uh, Carter was a precursor to Clinton as a new kind of Democrat. We might say that 
uh, Clinton is Carter with greater sex appeal, uh, fortunate enough to be president in the post-Cold War prosperous era. By the way, some of the images you've been seeing on the screen of uh, pictures and campaign paraphernalia are located in the depot behind us, and we're going to go be going. We're going to go in there in a few minutes, but that's what you would see if you came here to visit. Professor Rebuffo, this is your first trip to Plains. I know you've been thinking about Jimmy Carter for a long time. What is? What do you think of this place? I think it's a. I think it's a lovely town. Uh, it does give a good impression of the early Carter, but I think we really need to move beyond Plains anecdotes with all due respect to the kindly people here and recognize that Carter had a long career and was a very complicated man and that complexity can't be explained by Plains alone. Uh, he was someone who valued efficiency but also moral uplift. He was someone who went to a naval academy but really was against military interventions. Uh, I like that. The Republicans didn't. He was someone who talked with great hyperbole, sometimes, sometimes with great precision. And though his religious life began here, it didn't end here. And he became quite a sophisticated lay theologian. Blackstone, Virginia, next. Go ahead, please. Yes, uh, I'd like to say when Carter was president, when he spoke to you, <clears throat> you knew that he was telling the truth, that he spoke his, his heart and he spoke for the people. And I feel like that they need to be more of this in, in the government today. People like him could lead us out of the situations that we're in today. Thank you. When he spoke, Leo Rebuffo, did you uh, believe him? Uh, in general, yes. But uh, like all human beings, he was uh, subject, I think, to some self-deceptions. I think there's no doubt that he was, as he sometimes described himself, a highly moral man. I think one of his problems is that he actually said that to various members of Congress who took it the wrong way. It seemed to imply that they were less than moral men, for example. Sylvan Lake, Michigan, you're next. Go ahead, please. Yes, my name is Tammy Ward, and I just moved here from uh, North Carolina, which I worked on the Democratic Party in Wilmington. And I just want to say I met Carter, and he's a fine, fine man. And the fact that he saves the taxpayers' money even after the fact, that he doesn't receive uh, monies after he has the past president, and he doesn't receive Secret Service money. And uh, you see the other congressmen and uh, presidents who receive money that, you know, they don't need that money. They're millionaires. And so he saves us money, and, you know, he just more people could look up to that and save taxpayers money and have that good morale. He's a millionaire. He doesn't need our taxpayers money. Put it to use in other ways, health care, um, education, and I really commend him for that. He says he doesn't need that. He's a millionaire already. Thank you. Let me ask you, if he, does he take Secret Service protection? He has protection? Secret Service. They travel with him all over the world, so he's like all the other presidents. Where he's different, and I think what our caller is trying to allude to, he does not sit on any corporate boards. I interviewed Ralph Nader once and Jimmy Carter, and that was a big point for Nader, that, you know, Car that Carter's the only of these ex-presidents that won't go on any board or use his name or take personal speaking fees like Ronald Reagan did when he went to Japan for the $2 million. Is he a wealthy presidency. man? Yeah, he was not, I would not call him a wealthy man, but he's, he, he's a, he has a above average income, and he makes most of his money on, um, he's a professor at Emory University, he has his presidential pension, and of course he gets fairly good advance money for the numerous books he's writing. He's writing two books right now. Where does he spend most of his time? I mean, how much of it spent here, how much of it spent in Atlanta? I think this is when I learned to interview President Carter, to interview him in planes, because this is where you get the Jimmy Carter that's just wearing a work shirt and jeans and in a relaxed fashion, and you get much more out of him. When he's and in, in the Carter Center in Atlanta, it's all suit and tie, all business, and everything's very clipped and methodical. This is his home. This is where he spends Christmas, Thanksgiving, lives the year round, is in Plains, but they stay in the apartment. I would say about 60% um, here um, and the rest in Atlanta or around the world. Again, if you're a teacher and uh, you want to get involved in what we're doing here, we have a telephone number for you to call. Give us a call back in Washington at 202-626-4858 or address cspan.org slash classroom. If you want to join the C-SPAN in the Classroom organization, it doesn't cost you any money. The material is free to you, and we'll be shipping it out so that you can have it for the replay of all these programs December 20th through the 30th, where one of these programs, if you're watching this live, will be played once, four times, there'll be four a day, 
over a period of 10 days roughly, and where 41 men will be presidents. The last program is on that Monday before uh, that week there with President Clinton from Hope, Arkansas. Albuquerque, New Mexico, you're next. Go ahead, please. Good morning. Uh, I, I'm an admirer of President Carter, and therefore I'm puzzled as to why a president who favored rubber bullets in Iran would have authorized the sale of helicopters to the Indonesia military with which to subdue the East Timorese. And I wonder how he felt about that now. Leo Rabafo, you know anything about this? Presidents do not operate in a vacuum. I think the post-presidential Jimmy Carter is the gut-level Jimmy Carter, the moral human rights activists. But presidents, uh, particularly during the Cold War, were obliged to make all sorts of compromises. And uh, uh, aiding the Indonesians is one case, supporting um, the communist regime of Cambodia as the legitimate government is another. Tilting away from human rights in 79 and 80 uh, is another. Uh, I think that Carter's record on human rights is as good as any president in this century. In fact, there's no other president who showed so much respect for poor and weak and non-white nations. And Carter made the human rights issue a permanent part of our world. So though I like the call of wish he had made fewer compromises, I think those are inevitable, and I think his record on a whole is very, very good. Let me ask the, the both of you about the Malay speech of July of 1979. Uh, why was it given, and what impact did it have? Uh, Doug well, it hurt Carter greatly, the fact that we're talking about it right now. And the frustration for him was he never used the word Malays. Uh, and if you read the speech itself, it's actually a very interesting and wonderful speech about a need for, for limitations of American waste. But it was tied to the, re the forced resignation of his cabinet, and then he gave this speech, and he seemed to be blaming the American people for the problems of, that the country was facing instead of taking the burden on himself, and that didn't go over well. Actually, in, when the speech was first delivered, it was considered a success, but it, it, but it started gnawing at him, and the word malaise the, um, came to stick to him, and he was called that over and over again, the malaise man, by um, the Reaganites in the 1980 campaign a and beyond. A little bit past the halfway point in his, his one-term presidency. Yes. Uh, Leo Rebuffo, comment on that speech? Uh, well, I think no one popularized the term malaise more than Teddy Kennedy, who loved to string it out over his tongue. Uh, what Carter was trying to do uh, in, in his own idiom was to say the only thing we have to fear is fear itself, or ask not uh, what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country, as Roosevelt and Kennedy did. Uh, the speech, however, was not a success in rallying the country, and I, think, I don't think only because he reorganized his, his cabinet. I think there is an element there of Jimmy Carter telling the country, I'm more abstemious, I'm more moral than you. Vice President Mondale had, had warned him of the risks in that. Now, the day may come in another energy crisis where we put a Carter monument next to the Lincoln Memorial, but I think there were some problems with the tone in terms of the kind of upbeat rhetoric a president really needs, perhaps unfortunately, to motivate Americans. We're going to take a break. During this break, we're going to show you a little bit of this speech from July of 1979, Jimmy Carter addressing the nation. You can make up your own mind, look at it, and we'll continue uh, opening the phones up and getting your comments as we continue our program from Plains, Georgia, about 150 miles south of Atlanta. Days confirmed my belief in the decency and the strength and the wisdom of the American people. But it also bore out some of my long-standing concerns about our nation's underlying problems. I know, of course, being president, that government actions and legislation can be very important. That's why I've worked hard to put my campaign promises into law. And I have to admit, with just mixed success. But after listening to the American people, I have been reminded again that all the legislation in the world can't fix what's wrong with America. So I want to speak to you first tonight about a subject even more serious than energy or inflation. I want to talk to you right now about a fundamental threat to American democracy. I do not mean our political and civil liberties. 
they will endure. And I do not refer to the outward strength of America, a nation that is at peace tonight everywhere in the world with unmatched economic power and military might. The threat is nearly invisible in ordinary ways. It is a crisis of confidence. It is a crisis that strikes at the very heart and soul and spirit of our national will. We can see this crisis in the growing doubt about the meaning of our own lives and in the loss of a unity of purpose for our nation. The erosion of our confidence in the future is threatening to destroy the social and the political fabric of America. The 39th president continues. You can see him there walking down Pennsylvania Avenue on Inauguration Day on his way to the White House. And the reviewing stands there. And there from the East Room of the White House, Jimmy Carter, who changed the part on his hair during his administration. A one-term president from the small community where we're located right now with our live cameras, Plains, Georgia. She's just a short distance, two and a half hours south of Atlanta, the capital of the state of Georgia, the state in which our Yes, Doug Brinkley was born in, a man who's, Doug Brinkley lived in Perrysville, Ohio, and Leo Rebuffo from Patterson, New Jersey, another, our, one of our guests here. Mr. Brinkley, uh, you told me a story, this is really off the, uh, off the uh, subject of, uh, uh, of what we've been talking about, Jimmy Carter, that the fence around his house over here was B.B. Rebozo's old fence. Yeah. How did that work? It was, uh, they were looking for a secure fence, and B.B. Rebozo had one from during the Nixon White House period and so they moved it from Florida up here and so it surrounds the Carter home today. Leo Rebuffo, when did you first get interested in Jimmy Carter and why are you writing a book about it? Well, I was interested in Jimmy Carter when he was President of the United States, uh, obviously, and uh, I'm an unreconstructed um, McGovernite, so I found uh, Carter a little conservative for my taste. Uh, as a scholar, I started working on him in the mid-1980s and have spent a lot of time at the Carter Library. and found many pleasant surprises. Uh, I found that his staff was a lot better than journalistic legend would have it. And I found that he worked fairly closely with Teddy Kennedy fairly late. And I think one of his political mistakes was uh, not, in a sense, def deflecting Kennedy's challenge in 1980 by advocating Kennedy's prime goal, national health insurance. But most of all, I discovered, as anyone who studies any president learns, uh, that the man is a lot more complicated than he seems if you just watch him day to day in the press or on TV. We are now located, uh, Doug Brinkley and I are located in the depot, which you've been seeing behind uh, Professor Brinkley earlier in this program. You can see a bunch of banners around the wall. And one of the ones I want to ask you both about before we take our next call, and we have 
uh, phone lines up on the screen here in just a moment. There's one over here I'm looking at, and I doubt if we're going to get a picture of this. It says, it's time for the people to run the government and not the other way around. Jimmy Carter, a leader for change. I was watching the debate last night from New Hampshire, and the same kind of thing is being said, Doug Brinkley, today. In every campaign, it's time for the people instead of the government to run us. Does it ever change? Well, I think it changes, but Carter's a real case of that, what you call populist rhetoric. He, he fashioned himself as a peanut populist during the 76 campaign. And what he meant by government was the government that gave us the Vietnam War, the government that seemed to not be able to control violence and riots in the streets, and the government of Richard Nixon uh, in Watergate and deceptions and lies, and the government of Gerald Ford that gave the, uh, gave the pardon. So it was a clear time of running uh, against Washington, perhaps more than ever. Let's go to uh, Circle Montana for our next call. Go ahead, please. You're on the air. Uh, first, I'd like, like Hello, to say Circle. how much uh, we enjoy C-SPAN way out Circle here. Circle Montana, the are you there? Like a window on Let's the Let's try Shelburne, Vermont. Shelburne, Vermont, are you there? Yes, I am. Shelburne, Vermont, we'll try once again. We must be having some problems with our lines. Shelburne, are you there? Leo Rebuffo. Uh, you... The populism outsider business? But what I was going to ask you about is uh, you've been listening to Doug Brinkley for the last uh, hour and a half or so. Uh, anything that he said during that time that you want to have a different opinion on or, or some other? I, I would elaborate a bit. Uh, Doug and the questioners from the audience have raised terrific issues. Uh, I've already stressed that, that Carter is a pretty sophisticated religious thinker. I think we should talk a little bit more about race and class in the making of Carter. Uh, in terms of class, he is an agribusinessman, uh, a mid-level businessman, and that, I think, is what distinguishes him from the New Deal, Fair Deal, Great Society tradition. Uh, he's suspicious of big government, big business, and big labor, and so he harks back more to an earlier kind of liberalism, what historians call progressivism. Uh, I think it's also stunning that someone from Carter's background became not only a convert to immigration, uh, not only a convert to integration, but an advocate, a firm advocate, you see this in the White House files, of affirmative action for blacks and other minorities. And I think just as uh, Kennedy's election meant the question of a Catholic presidency was closed, uh, the election of Jimmy Carter, a segregationist convert to integration, really sealed the notion of legal black equality in the United States. And you see that all around the inaugural, the sense of the country coming together across racial lines, uh, whether it's George Wallace or Hank Aaron at the inaugural. This program produced by Maura Pierce and it's being directed by... Brett Betzel, as we go, let's try one more time. Circle Montana, are you there? Yes, sir. You're on the air. I want to uh, tell, tell you how much we enjoy C-SPAN uh, way out here in the boondocks. It's like a window in the world for us. Thanks. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I would like to point out some things about the Carter administration. One thing, two things. The hostage situation in the Panama Canal were no-win situations. Nobody could have done the right thing on those things. And, uh, and we had such uh, virulent and violent uh, opposition uh, uh, stirring up a mess about those things. I think one of the things that helped defeat Carter the most was the criminal actions of Paul Volcker with the Federal Reserve System. Uh, while Carter was the president, the interest rate, rent rate, rate went from about 5% to over 21%. Uh, then when uh, Reagan was a candidate, they dropped the interest rate clear down to, to about 3.5%. This criminal uh, rigging of the, of the financial system bankrupted a lot of people. I know we had financed a home, and our interest rate went from 13% to 22%. And uh, it, it, it doubled. It, the amount we owed on the home doubled in just four years. All right, Circle Montana, thanks. Let me go on then to Shelburne, Vermont, for our next caller. Go ahead, please. You're on the air. Yes, uh, my name is Jim Collier, and I, I was the number one graduate in Jimmy Carter's class at the Naval Academy. I'd also like to remind people that uh, Admiral Bill Crow, who became chairman of the Joint Chiefs and ambassador to the Great Britain, was also in our class. I did not know Jimmy at the Naval Academy because of the way the uh, organization was structured, but I met him when he was governor for the first time, 
and it has always seemed to me, based on my experience with him then and as he was running for president, that the biggest mistake he made was not to deal more intensively one-on-one -on -one with leaders in Congress, committee chairmen, and so forth, because Jimmy was absolutely superb in a one-on-one -on -one situation and came across like Al Gore uh, in public appeals. And well, let me let me ask you about yourself a little bit. You you're from Shelburne, Vermont, but you say you finished first in your class at the United States Naval Academy. Yes. What year was that? We graduated in 1946. Uh, we were called the class in 1947. How long did you stay in the Navy? I stayed in seven years, about the same length of time Jimmy did, and I think our common experience in the academy gave us a perspective on the Defense Department that interestingly enough led most of our class to be very anti-Carter uh, while he was president, uh, thinking he was much too liberal and much too soft on defense. But in fact, Carter understood the role of defense and the need for the strength, but saw how badly, how sloppily, and how wastefully the de defense department generally has been run. Thank you, sir, for calling. Doug Brinkley? Well, first off, I hope you can leave your telephone number with uh, the C-SPAN people, because I'd like to interview you um, about your time at Annapolis uh, when President Carter was there. Stansfield Turner, in addition to Crowell, was also a member of that class. Turner going on to be head of the CIA. And uh, President Carter at, at Annapolis was, um, you know, he ran cross-country track. A lot of people, what I've interviewed a number of people from his class who knew him, and they all tell me one interesting thing about him. Something, you never would swear around Jimmy Carter, they say. You never would say, God damn, or something else. Something about his appearance and the way he carried himself. Not that he was prudish, but you just felt like not using foul language around him. And also, that, that even during this time in Annapolis and then in the Navy, the Bible was a big part of his life. And I was stunned to find out in Norfolk when he was there on his days off, um, when he had leave, he would hold Bible classes. So it wasn't, he didn't just sort, certainly find religion, um, you know, later in his life. And then finally, uh, President Carter signed a document where I was able to get his uh, records from Annapolis and from um, St. Louis Nash, the archives. And I was amazed to read all of his naval reports. He was extraordinary on a very fast track. His original objective in life, his goal, was to become chief of naval operations. And so he was, he really had his eye on a career in the Navy until he came here and saw his father in his house vomiting and ill with, um, his, with pancreatic cancer. And all these people came to see Mr. Earl in his deathbed and tell him how much he meant to them and how much he did. And Mr. Earl at that point was in the state legislature. And Carter had to think, do I want to spend my life in the Navy or can I make more of a difference here at home taking part in community grassroots politics? Chester, Virginia, you're next. Go ahead, please. Good morning, Brian, and thanks, C-SPAN, for this wonderful series. You guys are doing a really terrific job with it. Um, I have one uh, comment from Mr. Brinkley since we uh, were talking about President Carter's defense policies. I was in Jimmy Carter's Air Force for two years, and I was in Ronald Reagan's Air Force for two years. I can't tell you the market difference we had then. I was in the Air Training Command. From 1978 to 1980, we had approximately 225 planes on our base. Uh, it was a miracle that we had 100 of them mission-capable during that uh, two-year span. Within six months of... Uh, President Reagan taking office, all of our aircraft were uh, mission capable. Uh, he gave us a 13.1 pay raise across the board, and uh, the morale in the military went up, and it went up quickly. Having said that, I'd also like to say that I think that uh, President Carter will go down in history as our greatest ex-president. I've grown to admire the man, Mr. Brinkley. I intend to mind your book, and uh, I think he's a great man that, that should be admired. But uh, back, back in those days, back. he... Uh, he wasn't well liked by me and a lot of people that were in the military, and that's kind of a you know it's a shame. But Ronald Reagan really turned that around for our country. Thanks, caller. Let me go to Leo Rebuffo to get his uh, point on all this. Well, there there are a couple of questions hanging. Uh, I think calling someone the best ex-president is a little like calling him the best ex-husband, and I think Carter deserves better for that, better than that. Uh, he did make the right decisions on Panama and Iran. Uh, there was no postponing the Panama Canal treaties. Omar Torrios, the boss of Panama, sent word that there would be riots, attacks on the canal. He wasn't going to stop them. It was the irresponsible conservatives who opposed the canal treaties. Similarly, uh, Carter was wise not to involve the United States militarily in the Iranian Revolution. Uh, there's no doubt that Reagan sponsored the largest military buildup in American history, but 
For those who think a military buildup is a presidential virtue in the era of the 70s and the 80s, uh, Doug's absolutely right. Um, it, it begins a little bit under Ford and then steps up considerably under Carter. Let's give uh, our audience, if you've just joined us, kind of an overview of where we are. We are in the town of Plains, Georgia, and uh, earlier we learned that there are just a little over 700 people in this community. We have cameras around this area. This camera is located right on that, right in that median strip there. You've got the railroad tracks on the right. At the very back is the depot where we're located with our bus and also inside our set. Off to the left, Doug Brinkley, is we're about to see uh, some stores. What's in those stores? On Main Street, well, there's now a lot of souvenir shops and ice cream shops, and uh, it's pretty much a just sort of boutiques up there now, and many of them catering to the tourists to come here. Plains has become part of the National Park Service as an actual site, is as a town, uh, which is really quite unique in the Park Service. And one of the ideas is to preserve this community like it would have looked in, the, in say, the 1920s or 1930s when Jimmy Carter was growing up. Um, and remember, Carter was born, there was no electricity in this community. He was born uh, in, a, in a different world, rural electrification of, uh, had not come to fruition yet. And so he's seen a lot of changes in his lifetime from his early years here. And also, he used to come down and sell boiled peanuts. You're looking at Plains 1925, that's a year after Carter was born. And he would sell these boiled peanuts there as a, as a young boy. And also, there was a shop there, he'd get nickel hamburgers and kind of loiter around town and, um, and go up, um, you know, visit various business people. In a moment, I will get our camera to turn around out there and show you where the water tower is. Those of you who have visited here before, that's the first thing you see when you drive into town. And then right below it, the, the peanut warehouses and uh, the big American flag on the side of the water tower. This is a community that's about 150 miles from Atlanta. It's a national uh, historic site, National Park Service. Uh, runs this, a lot of this community. There are still people that live here. And Jimmy Carter, as Doug Brinkley pointed out earlier, lives in this town, comes here often, teaches Sunday school at the, pronounce it again, the Maranatha? Maranatha Baptist Church. Baptist Church. As we go to Concord, Arkansas. Go ahead, please. You're on the air. Yes, my name is Rhonda Fairfield, and being a resident of Arkansas, I think that there are some things that um, the comparison that Professor Rebuffo um, made about President Carter to, to President Clinton. I see that both of them are Democrats and both of them have been president, but I think there's a drastic difference in the motivation of these two men. I think that uh, President Carter is a genuine public servant and a humanitarian, and I see pr President Clinton as being more of a professional politician. Um, I think that when you compare their character, I think that you'll see a drastic difference in these two men. Uh, President Carter, I believe, was a man that what you saw was what he is. I think he's a great man of character, and I think that is reflective of his life now, past his presidency. Caller, let just, me ask you. Let me ask you though, on the comparison, uh, uh, to take your premise that uh, that one is a politician and the other one is genuine. Then why did Jimmy Carter lose? Do you think in 1980 to Ronald Reagan? I think it was the condition of, of the uh, the economy in the country, and I think that the Iran Contra or the Iran problem with the hostages, I think that had a very negative impact. Well, do we blame the president for the economy, or do we give them credit for the economy? I mean, how does that work in your mind? No, I don't think it's that simple that you can can give a president credit or blame, but I think that the people as a whole that's who they look to as being the leader of the country. Leo Rebuffo, comment? Uh, certainly Carter and Clinton are very different in temperament and in character, but I think in ideology as new kinds of Democrats, they have a lot more in common with each other than either would have, let's say, Hubert Humphrey, George McGovern, uh, in that sense. Uh, Personality-wise, uh, we go back to the schmoozing question, the wheeling and dealing on Capitol Hill. Clinton likes it, thinks it's moral, and therefore is good at it. Carter never felt comfortable with that kind of politics, wheeling and dealing, though he was very good at symbolic politics and in that sense uh, was a politician. Uh, I should also add that he probably would have been very good wheeling and dealing on Capitol Hill had he wished to do so. After all, 
He managed uh, to bring peace between Sadat and Begin, and that was no easy task. San Francisco, you're next. Taking my call, I think the reason uh, that President Carter lost was uh, mentioned by one of the other callers earlier, where the interest rates were jacked up far beyond where they were. Uh, my comment is essentially this, uh, that he wrote a book, The Blood of Abrahams, and the book was about peace uh, in the Middle East. Uh, President Carter would, in my opinion, be the ideal figure to be, uh, uh, go to the Middle East like Mountbatten and try to resolve this nuclear face-off between India and Pakistan. My question is why he hasn't really taken that issue up, or even though he would be the ideal man. And he stands head and shoulder above all the candidates uh, running these days. If you had watched the debate yesterday, it was like a school debate with the silly questions and, you know, rehearsed answers. When President Carter talks about the issue, he really knows the issue inside out. And it's just unfortunate that a man like him is not the president of the United States today. And can Thank he you. run or I, not? Thank Doug Brinkley. I think he would be a, even a much better president today after the experience he's had during his post-presidency. Um, the book you're referring to, um, Blood of Abraham, he wrote during his post-presidency on his trips uh, in 1983 all over the Middle East. And he's become a master negotiator of track two diplomacy and of defusing international crises. I think he would be terrific um, um, dealing with the nuclear issue in India and Pakistan, as he was dealing with the problem with Kim Il-sung in North Korea. But he is out of office. He does not hold an official office. And the Clinton administration, and they're, from their perspective, many ways rightfully so, wants to have their administration do the brokering, not constantly bringing in a freelancer. They tried Carter in Haiti and North Korea in 94 and it worked but there was a lot of conflict and the State Department got quite bitter by some of um, Carter's interloping if you'd like. Wilmington, Delaware next. Go ahead please. Hi Brian, great show and uh, terrific series here on all the presidents. Um, I was wondering if uh, Doug Brinkley could comment on Jimmy Carter's uh, post-presidency, his, his enormous accomplishments with the Carter Center, but more importantly his, his work with uh, groups like Habitat and other humanitarian programs and also how that would stack up with other retired presidents of the 20th century? Well, I think Jimmy Carter is one of the handful of truly great ex-presidents. The other might be John Quincy Adams, who served 16 years in Congress and fought for the abolition of slavery. There are others of this century, like Theodore Roosevelt, who left the White House and then went to create the Bull Moose Party and run for the presidency again. You have people like Herbert Hoover, who left in a sense of, of despair and disarray of the, the Great Depression and went on to fairly well rehabilitate himself. Um, you also have um, Richard Nixon, who of course left the White House in shame but became a global statesman of, of sorts. But nothing compares to Jimmy Carter. He's redefined what it means to be ex-president. He's raised the bar to a new level. Anybody leaving office is going to have the Carter factor. How can I do what Carter's done um, as, a, as an objective? But to be fair to the presidents like Bush and Ford, and in, in, in particular Bush and Ford, you know, they had long public service careers. They were a lot older um, than Carter when he left office. President Carter was in his 50s, and he had naturally a, a life ahead of him. But what's so admirable is the way that he took the things that worked in his presidency and parlayed them into this amazing ex-presidency. And I think that his election monitoring, his health initiatives, particularly in Africa, his, his disease eradication, task force and his work with Habitat for Humanity, he deserves a Nobel Prize, which, he's, which has eluded him for all of those efforts he's done out of the White House. A lot of the pictures you're seeing are on the wall here inside the depot, and as we learned earlier, Miss Lillian, the mother of Jimmy Carter, used to sit out here on the porch and visit with people during the campaign, and when Jimmy Carter was president, she's now buried out here in the cemetery, uh, not too far away from here, about a mile or two. And want to remind you, those of you who are watching, one of the main reasons we do this series is for education purposes. And those of you who are teachers, we have special material available for you, including that timeline poster that uh, was done by our staff that can show you where a president uh, was before he became president and how long they were in office. And uh, it's, it, it's done in a color scheme with uh, the years. You can look up on the chart and see where all presidents were at different times in their lives. The number to call is 202-626-4858 or cspan.org slash classroom. There's no money involved in this. We won't come back at you later and ask you for things. This is for your use in the classroom. Give us a call right now. Our folks in our education department are there to talk to you about this. Columbia, South Carolina, you're next. Go ahead, please. Thanks for C-SPAN. This is a great series. Thank you. Uh, 
I was exposed to Mr. Carter early on when he was governor of Georgia, and I worked for the governor of South Carolina, who was one of his first supporters when he decided to run for president. And uh, during that campaign and during his presidency, I always looked at him as the author of empty gestures, uh, the suit bag being one of them. We finally found out that the suit bag was empty. He was just carrying it for the photo op. And the, the problem with the Baptist church, he could have stood up and said, in the Baptist church, the door should be open instead of uh, trying to defuse that situation. His Calvinist background, which basically believes human beings are a mess and don't deserve happiness, uh, has a lot to say about the Malay speech. But the worst was the sweater speech, where he told the American people that he listened to his nine-year-old daughter and she decided that nuclear proliferation, as if he didn't know that. So I, he he is a, was a much better ex-president than he was president. He was he was dreadful as a president. He had no vision. Um, he had a dark, moody uh, look at the world. And I, he, but he is a much better ex-president than than president. Thank Mayor you. Buffo, do you agree with this? Uh, this gentleman clearly could not be convinced. Uh, certainly, Carter had a vision, a passion for human rights, racial equality, and efficient government. Uh, the reference to Amy Carter comes from the presidential debate with Reagan, and it's very interesting that Reagan can get away with telling those sorts of anecdotes, and people think it's brilliant. And Carter tries it once, and it's seen as some horrendous political operation or a gaffe. Uh, Carter's problem in lots of cases was personal presentation, and I'm not saying that in a, in a bad sense. An earlier caller asked about the Reagan-Carter presidential debate. When I watched it, I thought Carter just clobbered him. I watched it again on tape a year ago, and Reagan's informality just has this kind of magic where Carter's less anecdotal candor just doesn't get through in lots of ways to Americans. Franklin, North Carolina, what's on your mind? Uh, yes, I have great respect for President Carter, and I was one of those who was proud to say it while he was president. Um, he, there, there is so much to be praised about him and the things he didn't do, such as quadruple the national debt that Reagan did. Sure, who couldn't make the country prosperous when you quadruple the national debt during the years you're in office with Star Wars and so on and so forth? He would never have authorized the horrendous, awful things that they did in South America during the uh, Reagan administration. Um, he never would have been in a position with Iran-Contra where Reagan really should have been impeached, and if he had stayed in office a little longer, he might have been. He didn't slip through a bill at the last few days of his uh, presidency saying that people who serve two terms in office, congressmen and senators, are entitled to retire at full pay for the rest of their lives. Thank you very much, President Reagan. We have to take these people who, who have sucked our money long enough and then pay for the rest of their lives. And when Reagan was out of office, he, took, uh, he was still taking money from the Japanese agreements that he made, but he arranged it so that it was after he was in office. And for the gentleman who found so much fault with President Carter, I say if you were in the office of the president and you saw what was going on all over the world, you'd have a dark attitude, too. That's Thanks, all. Caller. On Monday, we will be at the Reagan Ranch and we'll be doing the same thing about Ronald Reagan as we're doing about Jimmy Carter. Uh, you know, inside, in your book, this is not on the same thing that the caller was calling about, but in your book you refer to the fact that Menachem Begin was a different person around Jimmy Carter in private than he was in public, and you suggested he didn't treat him very well in private, meaning Menachem Begin, who used to run Israel. That's right. Well, the um, Begin and Sadat, Carter was very close to Sadat, and he had a much, much more difficult time than Begin. At one point, Brzezinski called him um, Begin a psycho from watching the way um, Begin was behaving at Camp David. But it's to Carter's great um, skills of keeping these two people together in, in the Maryland mountains, enforcing the, the Camp David Accord. And he was never close to Begin, but Sadat was considered his best friend. And I asked President Carter once about Sadat, how often he thinks about him. And he said every day he has a desk 
He, he, when Sadat gave his life, he was assassinated for the Camp David Accords. Jimmy Carter's decided, if Sadat could give his life for peace, I can dedicate the rest of my life for peace. He was that close to Brother Anwar. We're going to talk to Fred Boyles in a moment. Again, we go to Riverside, California. Go ahead, please. Yes, good morning. Good morning here in California. Um, I want to talk about Jimmy Carter and the Central American policy. Um, many, I don't know about the gentleman's book, but I, I Many people don't talk about what Jimmy Carter supported the Sandinista root rebels in Central America. During those four years of his presidency, that's when the Sandinista rebels built up, and through Panama and Omar Torrijos, Jimmy Carter um, supplied the arms to the Sandinistas against the Somoza dictatorship. So I believe his foreign policy towards Central America is to blame that Central America was thrown to communism. And uh, I think the Carter administration should have been more careful in selecting his advisors. Um, he supported the Sandinistas, and I just want to hear some sort of an explanation of why the current administration was so um, in favor of the Sandinista rebels against the Somoza dictatorship. There was a say in Nicaragua that, and the reason why was because Mr. Carter was from Annapolis, and Somoza was from West Point. <laughs> so I don't know what that means. But anyway, Leo Rebeza, I mean, I like thanks to... for your call. Leo uh, Carter was not a supporter of the Sandinistas. He was a classic American Wilsonian trying to find a middle way uh, between revolutionaries on the one hand and a dictator, Somoza, on the, on the other. And uh, negotiations proceeded for a long time. And this was one of those situations that Americans really have to begin to grasp where there is no democratic middle way. And Carter was ultimately faced with the choice of allowing Somoza to use American weapons to kill Nicaraguans or backing off and letting Somoza fall. And he made the right choice. I think it needs to be said that between 1981 and 1984, people died in Central America who would have lived if Jimmy Carter had been reelected. Fred Boyles, who is the superintendent for the National Park Service for this site, you've been listening to uh, a lot of conversation over the last couple of hours. Anything you want to add that, uh, or, or change or correct? Well, just the, the last comment that we heard or the last call about Nicaragua, one of the most important things that President Carter did after leaving office in 1990 was monitoring elections in Nicaragua. And, uh, uh, of course, that uh, election was uh, uh, quite difficult. And Violetto Chamorro was running against uh, Daniel Ortega. And the... Uh, uh, Chamorro won the election and Ortega considered uh, uh, holding a coup so that he could retain office and Jimmy Carter stayed up with him almost throughout the whole night and uh, convinced him that there was life after uh, losing an election and so there was a, a uh, turnover of government and the, and the election stood and democracy stood in Nicaragua. That noise you're hearing is the wind blowing outside. It is a crisp but uh, very sunshiny day here in Plains, Georgia, and uh, Fred Boyle standing in front of the depot. Miami, Florida, you, you're next. Hello, Miami, you're on the air. Uh, what explanation can you give of Jimmy Carter giving the Panama Canal away? I presume he's going to be happy down there this month uh, giving it away. Well, of course, uh, most people don't think that he gave the Panama Canal away. Uh, it was, an, a, 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 I think, a necessary agreement. I agree with Leo completely on it. One interesting sidebar, you know, many people on the right always talk about the giveaway. Well, two of his biggest allies, Jimmy Carter, and I've seen the documents, the Carter Library, were Barry Goldwater, who was for the Panama Canal Treaties, and John Wayne, who wrote um, letters to um, Jimmy Carter telling him, I'll do whatever I can to help you on the Panama issue. Uh, sometimes the American right Conservatives pretend that it's only you know liberals who wanted to deal with Panama Canal, but Goldwater and um, and John Wayne are just two examples of more conservatives that supported it. On Alaska, Washington, you're next. Thanks for joining us. Yes, good morning there, Brian. Uh, I got a, a comment on the uh, Jimmy Carter giveaway on the Panama Canal too, on the Hay Buno Varillo Treaty uh, of 1903. This was the legal uh, treaty on this uh, canal, and when Jimmy Carter got in there in 1977, he negotiated the uh, Torrios Treaty there that was an illegal treaty uh, due to the fact that the United States Senate did never ratify the Torrios portion of the treaty. 
It was not uh, negotiated properly there. For that reason, it's not a legal treaty. All right. Leo Rebuffo, you want to comment? Uh, it's, a, it's a perfectly legal treaty. I think what needs to be emphasized is that negotiations for the canal did not begin under Jimmy Carter. They began under Lyndon Johnson. They began after attacks on the canal zone and riots in January 1964 that cost lives of Americans and Panamanians. That would have happened on a much larger scale again. This was one of the wisest decisions of Carter's presidency. Now, it backfired politically, and we can tell from the calls that it still raises hackles but it was a wise decision. Leo Rebuffo, you're from Patterson, New Jersey. Where did you go to school? I went to Rutgers in New Jersey, uh, of which I'm very proud, and Yale Graduate School. And how do you come at Jimmy Carter politically? I mean, what side of the spectrum are you on, right or left, or do you want to discuss Well, it? sure. Uh, I mean, I am one of those historians who still believes if there can't quite be total objectivity, at least there can be detachment and fairness. But I am an unreconstructed McGovernite, and I am one of those scholars who would criticize Carter from the left and like many of the dovish things that some of the callers don't like. By the way, our guest on Monday will be Lou Cannon, who has written three books on Ronald Reagan. Uh, Doug Brinkley, how do you come at Jimmy Carter? You are the, kind of the official biographer of all, of at least the, the first book was the Unfinished Presidency. Mm -hmm. where, where are your politics? Well, I try to be objective in it. I have to say that I have admiration for Jimmy Carter. I wouldn't approach him as a subject, and I wanted to learn more about him. Um, so I've come at it just trying to be as honest and fair as I can be. And with a, uh, uh, you know, I believe in storytelling, and I think Jimmy Carter is a great American story. The rise here from Plains to the White House. You know, th there's been a saying that Jimmy Carter is the closest we've ever come to picking a president out of the phone book. And that appealed to me because you hear about Oliver Stone's JFK movie and conspiracy theories and the whole game's rigged. If Carter can make it to the White House, any of our young listeners out there can be president, male or female, someday. And I think that's one of the aspects of the Carter story that I've always been drawn to. And Fred Boyles, how do you approach it from a political point of view? You're a member of the National Park Service, you're a government employee. Do you have politics in this for you, from your own point of view? Well, I pretty much apolitical, but uh, I'm, I'm much like Doug in that I'm a great respecter of uh, Jimmy Carter. I, I, I don't think you can put Jimmy Carter in a box. He's not a liberal. He's not a conservative. Uh, he's he's uh, uh, a remarkable man and has done just uh, phenomenal things with his life. He's, he's lived uh, in an ordinary community, but lived an extraordinary life. And on behalf of the Park Service, we think that's a very special part of the story. Another part of the story that's uh, uh, especially important for us to tell is that other than his time in the Navy, his time as governor and his time as president, Jimmy Carter has always lived here in Plains, Georgia, and, and Roseland as well. How many years have you been here again? Ten years. And where's your hometown originally? I'm from Gainesville, Florida. And what kind of, where'd you go to school? I went to the University of Georgia and then graduate school at Clemson. We're going to let you go and thank you again for all the help you've given us and your, your you. assistance here. Uh, and we're going to meet someone in a few moments, Annette Weiss, who I know you had something to do with and helped uh, introduce a program. Tell us just in 30 seconds what the program is, and we'll let her tell us how she does it in a moment. Well, we're privileged to have the school that Jimmy Carter and Rosalind Carter went to. And so we initially thought what a, what a great place for kids to come and to learn this wonderful story. And uh, so with that very simple premise, uh, we began planning for an educational program that would be able to serve the needs of the students in Georgia and North Florida and uh, uh, Southern Alabama uh, who could come here and spend a day where a president of the United States went to school. Thank you again, Ranger Boyles. We go next to Pensacola, Florida. Go ahead, please. You're on the air. Hey, Brian. How you doing? Good. I Welcome. I have a comment and a question. Uh, my comment is, I think President Carter now, and I have total respect for him now, is the greatest president as far as being an ex-president. But I was, I'm retired Navy, and I was uh, in the Navy the whole time Carter was president. And everybody liked Carter up until, and, I, and, and this is the question I'm going to have for Mr. Brinkley, is the Iran thing. Everybody seen him as having no backbone whatsoever, and he lost total respect from the military community. So my question to Mr. Brinkley is, uh, does he think that if, if that was handled quickly, would, would that have reelected? Would, would President Carter have gotten reelected? Because I, I think, like I said, everybody had total respect for him up until that point. 
Thanks. Doug Brinkley. Well, I think the answer is yes, if it could have been resolved quickly, but the big question was how to resolve it, and nobody thought about this issue more than Jimmy Carter. I mean, as he says, I, what, what did you want me to do, bomb Tehran? What were our options at that point? I don't think he handled that year properly. To seem like he was being, America was held hostage, and that he was, had his whole white uh, Rose Garden strategy throughout 1980, and making it, they never seemed to be able to diffuse it. He got too detail-oriented in it. Not Jimmy, the humanitarian in Jimmy Carter overwhelmed him. He got to know about every one of the hostages' biography. He met their wives. He met their uncles and aunts and children, and he personalized each, and he was determined to bring them all back alive. And he, from his point of view, he succeeded, but I think by keeping that strategy going for that long and not getting them released before the election, it cost him the election. San Francisco, you're next. Thanks for joining us. Good morning, gentlemen. I was just wondering, um, the policy that three callers ago said about Samosa and his ideas and so on and so forth, I respect President Carter. But at the same token, he's a humanitarian. He's trying to serve everyone in the world. But why don't we start, me as an immigrant from Nicaragua, that a lot of people die. And why, I don't know. Who's going to answer to the mother of these kids to die? Because the communists provide whatever, and myself, I'm pro right. But why, as an American, that I was raised in this country, and I feel like an American, I will die for this country, why don't we start at home? Instead of building jails, why don't we build more schools? Why don't we give kids a chance to become a true American, land of the free and the brave? If we pay taxes, why don't we help ourselves first? I don't want to be like something I can say on TV, but we are becoming naive to our own existence. We Thanks, shall. San Francisco. Thanks for your point of view. We're going to keep going, though, because this program is about Jimmy Carter. And we go to Tampa, Florida next. What would you like to say? Uh, good, good morning. How are you? Fine. Welcome. Listen, I, I think it's, it's interesting listening to uh, these points about the different presidents. If you're Democrat, you're for Carter. If you're Republican, you're for Reagan. And it's too bad we can't get beyond this and just be honest with ourselves. I consider myself a Republican, but I'd vote for the best person. I think the reason why Carter was elected was because Gerald Ford, I think, was unable to restore the spirit that the American people were looking for after the disgrace of uh, Richard Nixon. And I think that when Ronald Reagan came along, um, that spirit that the American people were looking for, Carter just didn't, just didn't bring it to what they wanted. And I think Ronald Reagan had vision. He brought excitement. And I think that's why George Bush lost in 92, because along came Bill Clinton with that same type of excitement and vision. And I think that, you know, the listeners and the American people need to understand that, you know, we got to get past this Democrat. No matter what, we got to support the Democrats. No matter what, if we're Republican, we got to support the Republicans. we got to start seeing things for what they really are. And I think that if we can get beyond this political stuff, we'll really see Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan, George Bush, and so on for what they really are. And I think that, you know, that's just something we need to do as Americans and get beyond the political stuff and appreciate these men for what they've really done. Thanks, Tampa. Leo Rebuffo? I think we should appreciate them and criticize them in a nonpartisan way. Absolutely. I would certainly say that Ronald Reagan was the most consequential president of the uh, last third of the 20th century. But as to the specific point, I think Ford lost, Carter lost, Bush lost, not for any defects as leaders, but primarily for economic reasons. And in the case of Ford, in addition, the pardon of Nixon, a wise decision, as even Carter belatedly said, is something that probably pushed Ford over the edge to defeat. Annette Weiss is standing outside this depot, and she teaches high school kids. Tell us about your project, Annette Weiss. We have a wonderful partnership here in Plains. The Jimmy Carter National Historic Site decided that they wanted to have a teacher on staff, and so they worked together with the Georgia Department of Education and the Sumter County School System, and were able to form a partnership so we can have a full-time teacher on staff, and I am that full-time teacher. We have students from all over the state of Georgia that come in to learn about the life of Jimmy Carter and to experience Hometown USA right here in Plains, Georgia. We do have students that come in from uh, surrounding states but the bulk of our students come from Georgia. How does it work though? I mean what, did, did, how much time do people spend with you? 
That varies. We have some groups that arrive right at 9 o'clock when the museum opens, and then we have others that um, will have to arrive a little bit later. A lot depends on the distance they're coming from. Um, we do have students and teachers that come into the area and spend the night in the area, and they will come to Plains and spend a day here. Usually the teachers and students arrive at 9 o'clock, and most of the time they've uh, left for their schools by 2 or 2.30. So how much total time will they spend with you as you teach Jimmy Carter to them? I am their teacher for the day. The only time I'm not with them is the time that they um, have lunch or are watching the video in the auditorium. What do you show them? The first thing we usually start out with is a short introduction of the high school and the history of the school and the importance of it because Jimmy and Rosalind Carter both attended that school. Uh, we begin in the auditorium, they watch the introduction video, and then after that, according to what the teacher has requested, we then go into the different lessons. Here in the state of Georgia, we have QCC objectives for the state, so all of the programs that are taught or lessons that are taught are based on QCC objectives that dovetail with the history of this uh, site. We're going to take a couple calls. Stay where you are and we'll get back to you with a couple more questions. Rock Island, Illinois, you're next. Hi, good morning. How you doing? Morning. Uh, the reason I'm calling is uh, I'm kind of like in the middle with uh, Jimmy Carter. I voted for him when he became president and I voted him out of office voting for Ronald Reagan because of what he did while he was in office. Uh, and I, I come from the point of view of uh, things like he, he did participate and finalize the giving away of the Panama Canal, which we're now going to see the results with the uh, Chinese having control of it, and uh, that in turn will mean that the uh, uh, communists will have control in this hemisphere of our most important gateway to the oceans. And then uh, I, was, I was a young husband, and I was also in the retail business at the time, and the inflation rates were just absolutely horrendous, and the interest rates were horrendous, and it took somebody like Ronald Reagan with his policies, and not a, it wasn't perfect, but it got us back on the right track for the economic growth that we're having during this time period. All right, sir, thanks. Let me just take another call, because that was more of a statement. Scott's Bluff, Nebraska. Go ahead, please. Yeah, I was very young, actually, when... Uh, Jimmy Carter was president. However, I was stationed in Panama during Operation Just Cause, and um, I was down there when he came down to oversee the elections. And I know that he had made a comment to the soldiers down there that he wasn't so convinced that the treaty was such a good idea. I was just curious if he had any comments on that. Doug Brinkley? Well, I'm not sure the heard him correctly because he constantly talks about the Canal Treaty being one of his great accomplishments and something he's extraordinarily proud of and for good reason. I'd like to just say we've been getting a lot of Panama um, Canal calls and it's become a bit of a mythology of the importance of the Panama Canal for American strategic interest today. It's not a gateway for us for anything anymore. It was extraordinarily important when it was built when Theodore Roosevelt was president, although it turned out not to be as significant as we thought even then. And basically today, it's, um, it, there, yes, shipping goes through it, and we have in the Canal Treaty provisions, American ships will continue to use it and go through it, and cruise ships will continue to go through it, and you're not going to see a whole lot of difference going on. The Canal giving, as Leo's been very good on this point, I think um, that it began with Lyndon Johnson, and it went up to Carter, and it became a vote in the Senate, and it passed, and we need to get beyond this sort of... Uh, partisan wrangling about Jimmy Carter giving away the canal. The United States made an agreement to return the canal uh, zone back to the Panamanian people. Annette Weiss says you teach Jimmy Carter to these high school students. Uh, do you know of any other place uh, in the United States where there is a historic site like this where there is a connection between teaching and the president? Well, I think a lot of sites have programs that they offer, and the National Park Service Park Rangers, I'm sure, do a terrific job in all of the, the sites all over the United States. This is unique because we do have the state of Georgia, our Department of Education, and the school system locally working with the Park Service to provide an excellent opportunity for students to come and experience history. And that's one thing that's so important. It's one thing to read it in a book, but it's something else to come to the actual hometown of Jimmy Carter and to visit the 
campaign headquarters and the school that he attended, when you see students go through the school and they have the opportunity to go in the very classroom that Miss Julia Coleman taught English and literature in, the students are impressed. It makes a big impression on them. And like someone said earlier, if Jimmy Carter can do it, then someone else can. So it gives students a hope and a spirit, I believe. You got some students standing right around you there. Does Jimmy Carter ever come over and joined you in the class? He does, and I wanted to mention the students standing around me. Those are some of the Jimmy Carter National Historic Site Education Program team council members. These are students that have been working with me for three years now, and they come out and help me out on special presentations and at different times during the school year, so they're a very special group of students. And yes, Jimmy Carter does stop by sometimes. He knows that I have students every day. Um, he's popped in the school from time to time. He has stopped downtown when we've been downtown touring the downtown area. And when we've been out at the Boyhood Farm, even see, he's even stopped by there and talked to them about peanuts. So he's a very busy man, but he's very interested in the education of students. We're running out of time, Slidell, Louisiana, you're next. Go ahead, please. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I just had a comment uh, on several uh, <coughs> subjects that uh, I've been watching. Uh, one on the Panama Canal. Uh, my point of view from the uh, history that I've uh, studied on it is we built it, we paid for it, <coughs> and a lot of folks died building that canal. It's in our national interest to maintain some kind of presence down there. Uh, right now, the last report I got uh, from General Clark comments was is that the Chinese uh, communists are very interested in uh, putting military personnel on the ground there that's coming from his comment uh... i don't feel that this is in our national best interest in as much as they are experimenting with uh... intercontinental ballistic missile capabilities which could uh... uh... go to another cuban crisis situation okay, uh, Thanks. My... uh... let me ask uh... Leo Rabuffo, uh, we've talked a lot about the Panama Canal. There are a lot of other things that happened during the Carter years. How would you list three or four things that you think, not, not necessarily that you were in favor of them or against them, but, but had an impact on the country, decisions that he made during his term? Uh, I would think his decision to appoint Paul Volcker head of the Federal Reserve Board instead of moving in a, a more liberal direction, say, for wage and price controls, that certainly had an enormous impact. The Panama Canal treaties, as we can tell, had an enormous impact, not only raising the hackles of American conservatives, as we see here, but also making the United States much more respected in Latin America. I think without question, Carter's worst single decision, not one that stretched over a long period, was letting in the Shah of Iran. Uh, he didn't swear much, but his initial reaction to the Shah was, bleep the Shah. And he also understood that since uh, the embassy had been seized in March of 79, that letting the Shah in again would take that risk. He didn't make that decision as a technician and engineer looking into the, the Shah's health, I think, in a much, as much detail as he should have. And I think that was truly a disastrous decision. Leo Rebuffo is over at the high school where Annette Weiss uses uh, as a classroom. It's no longer uh, a school. We go to Denver, Colorado next. Go ahead, please. Well, thank you folks again for C-SPAN. It's absolutely wonderful. I've got three things to say. I think one of the saddest moments in the history of my Democratic Party is when the Kennedy challenge came to President Carter in, in 1980. It was abs There was no reason for Teddy to run. It was trying to maintain the Kennedy fantasy, uh, which has prevailed uh, since the 1960s. And I think that damage to President Carter was almost irreparable. The other thing that uh, amazed me, and I was a delegate for M Mr. Carter from South Dakota in 1976, he absolutely was a man of principle and moral fiber and had intellectual depth and strength that we rarely see in a president. And the third thing that just absolutely knocks my socks off is the fact that he'd never prospered by one single penny from his public service. Within, you know, a month or so after Reagan went off, as he took in a couple of million bucks and gave a couple of speeches in, uh, in, in Japan. And I think that contrast is something that I want my, gran my grandchildren to remember about President Carter. And God bless you folks for C-SPAN. Thanks for calling in. Doug Brinkley, you have to go, so we'll use this as the, your last comment on all this. Okay. What do you think well, of the caller? 
Well, um, I thought it was a, uh, I agree with them, and, uh, but I also uh, wanted to add, you asked Leo, what are some of the things maybe we forgot about since we were spending a lot of time on Panama. One was the deregulation of trucking, communications, airlines, which has a big impact on all of our lives. And I don't think we've talked about a human rights policy enough. I mean, it was Eleanor Roosevelt with the UN Declaration of Human Rights that, that made human rights a, a term in international affairs in, in our modern times. Jimmy Carter's the second name. And, you know, Orwell once was never that keen on Gandhi. He used to write some critical articles about Gandhi. And, um, you know, Gandhi making his salt marches, Gandhi and his human rights, Gandhi and his spinning uh, loom. And then Gandhi died. And uh, Orwell wrote, you know, now that Gandhi's gone, I really miss him. And what a clean smell he left behind. And I think when President Carter's no longer with us, it'll be that clean smell that he left behind, the integrity of this, this public service career as a whole. Are you going to write more books about him? I'm, I'm doing now the fir uh, first volume, which goes from birth in 1924 to winning the presidency in um, 1976, and then a second volume on the White House to match my third volume, The Unfinished Presidency. What's he like to work up close and personal with? Um, he's a very good interview, and he has an incredibly sharp mind. He's just turned 75 this past October 1st. He's been very helpful to me. He can be prickly, and he remembers events a certain way, and he does not see his administration as being failed or mediocre, which many historians feel that it is. And so uh, he believes he, in his record. What I admire about President Carter as a historian is anything he signed his name to, Jimmy Carter, he'd like to see open. He never signed his, a document that he does not want people to read. He's a man with a clear and clean conscience, which is very unusual in the world of politics. And he really has lived his life, which his favorite quote from Reinhold Niebuhr, the neo-Orthodox theologian, used to say, and that is, the sad duty of politics is to establish justice in a sinful world. You were born where? In Atlanta, Georgia. And then I grew, grew up in Ohio, went to Ohio State University undergraduate, and did my doctorate in U.S. diplomatic history at Georgetown University. And live now in New Orleans, and if people want a book, that, that, that history book, what's the title of it? The American Heritage History of the United States, published by Viking Press, and then the new one I did with Steve Ambrose, which is out all over now, called Witness to America. Thank you very much for coming to Plains. Thank you as always, Brian. And we're going to let Doug Brinkley go. He has to catch a plane and go back home. For those of you who have just joined us, we've got a few more minutes left. We'll take a look at the community that we're uh, in at the moment. It's Plains, Georgia. Right there, what you see on the screen is inside the depot. That's a, a picture outside the depot. And off to the right are the train tracks. Jimmy Carter's home, he lives there today, is down those tracks and off to the right about a mile or so. A gated uh, area right now because of Secret Service protection. Off on the left are the offices of his cousin uh, Hugh Carter, who's no longer alive. It used to have the worm business in the, and now it's a, a store that they uh, sell souvenirs. But you also have a bunch of stores right along there. And the big banner, which has been up there for as long as we can remember, that announces Jimmy Carter's hometown, and that he is the 39th president of the United States. Behind all this uh, is the peanut warehouse, which the business has been sold, and also uh, a little bit farther on, the big water tower that people who have been here before see as they come into the community from America's Georgia, which is about 10 miles away, and we're about 150 miles south of Atlanta. That's route 280. It's a U.S. highway right there on the, the left of the screen. And you can't see it now, but off to the left beyond that is where the old uh, baseball diamond was, where a lot of the media played when they uh, softball when they were here during the campaign of 76. Call waiting from Arlington, Texas. Leo Rebuffo and Annette Weiser are still with us. Go ahead, Arlington. You're on the air. Yes, sir. My name is Nathan Woodruff. I'm a theologian, and I would like to say when you really listen to President Carter, it is quite amazing the spectrum of theological knowledge he has from very conservative to very liberal and historical theology, too. And that's very impressive for a lay theologian. Also, could you comment on the effect that the deregulation of transportation had on the country? Thank you. Enjoy the show. Leo Rebuffo, you follow this issue of religion uh, rather closely, uh, it's, don't you? It's, it's, actually, it's actually through the study of religion and politics that I got interested in Carter. And I have an essay called God and Jimmy Carter in a book called Right, Center, Left. And I absolutely agree with the caller that uh, Carter is a sophisticated lay theologian. 
I'm less enthusiastic about deregulation. Uh, I think this is one of the areas where he could have worked better uh, politically, continued to work better with some people like Nader and Kennedy because they agreed on airline deregulation. But I think his anti-government rhetoric sanctioning deregulation, as good as the policies might have been economically, helped prepare the groundwork for dangerously anti-government attitudes. In that sense, there's more of a continuity than either Mike Grant between Carter on the one hand and Reagan on the other. A little over 700 people live here in Plains, Georgia. We go to Carson City, Nevada. Go ahead, please. Yes, uh, I'd like to say I like Jimmy Carter a lot. I think he's done more than any other president since he left office. I think the primary reason he did not get elected, he was not assertive enough. For instance, when Fidel Castro dumped all of his prisoners on our shores, I believe if Jimmy had put all those prisoners on a boat, called Fidel up and say, hey, Fidel, we're going to be there at 10 o'clock Monday morning. We're going to return all of your A1 citizens and if for any reason you don't like this, we'll resolve it, what we lay it. But we'll be there at 10 a.m. Monday. And I think the lack of assertiveness, lack of leadership, is really what cost this gentleman the election. Thank you. Thanks, caller. Annette Weiss, I know that um, w what you do most is teach high school kids about Jimmy Carter, but do you have any relationship at all with Rosalind Carter, and has she ever come around? Yes, and, and I would like to make a correction. I mainly work with 4th, 5th, 8th, and 11th graders. Those are the targeted grades for our uh, QCC objectives in the state of Georgia. However, I do have curriculum established for pre-kindergarten through 12th grade. Uh, Miss Roseland is a wonderful role model for students because she's done so much with health care, and she's just a very genuine person. Um, I often have the opportunity to talk to her, and she's a very um, wonderful person to know. What's she like? She's a very kind, um, kind-hearted person, deeply cares about the community, particularly cares about um, older Americans and, and older citizens, particularly in our community. Um, just a very sweet person. Someone that, that if you lived in this town, she would be the kind of person that you would want to be your friend. Next call, Cleburne, Texas. You're on the air. Uh, yes, sir. Um, I know you might get tired of hearing this, but I want to say this, that C-SPAN gives people a voice in this country that we don't have anymore. And I, w I want to praise you for that. And uh, the next thing is I'd like to make a confession of a fool. <laughs> uh, under Jimmy Carter, I had a wife and five kids, worked in a non-union machine shop, and made enough money to take care of that family with my wife staying at home with my kids. Uh, which I consider one of the greatest curses in this country right now as a working mom. Uh, all I have to do is look at the children at Columbine and uh, Arkansas to see that. Um, I made enough money under Jimmy Carter to support the moral majority and uh, 700 Club and all these right-wing organizations, and I was stupid enough not to realize that... Uh, this inflation they talked about at that time was uh, me. I was the inflation. I was making enough money to uh, keep my wife at home and raise some decent kids. And uh, another thing under Jimmy Carter, we did not have uh, cocaine by the ton, and we didn't have uh, uh, automatic weapons and homeless and unemployment and massive welfare. All these things are things that I created by voting for Ronald Reagan and George Bush. And... Uh, we could talk about this for for an hour, and I wished I could, but I thank you for freedom of speech. And I say this, if the people in Seattle felt like they had freedom of speech, they would not have been out on the street. Thank you very much, sir. Thanks, Cleburne, Texas. Uh, we want to show you a, a short video clip of Rosalind Carter back in 1998 talking about Jimmy Carter and tardiness as we get near the last uh, six or seven minutes of this program. Well, um, he always accused me of being late, and I always said I was never late to go somewhere, to go anywhere. And he would come in and watch me get ready the last five minutes or so. And um, it distressed me very much because I always felt like I was on time and, uh, and that he just anticipated that I was going to be late. 
And so he did on my birthday once. He gave me a little plaque that said. This is, as you can probably tell, <laughs> this has been a, a matter of argument with us for probably 35 years of our married life. And one morning, I woke up and went in and turned my computer on, and the date came up, August 18th. I said, oh, no, it's Rosen's birthday, and today's Sunday morning. I can't get her a present. So I thought, what could I give her that would be most appreciated? So I wrote a note to her, and I said, Rosa, never again in my life will I ever refer to tortedness in a negative way. And I signed it, and for the last 15 years, I've uh, kept my promise. And it's removed one wonderful opportunity for constant arguments between my wife. So we haven't had an argument about tardiness, at least for the last 15 and years. And I haven't been late, right? Never late. <laughs> that was a re an interview that we recorded with Jimmy Carter in 1998 at the Carter Center. But before we leave this, I want to make sure that archivist David Stanhope at the Carter Library in Atlanta gets our thanks and appreciation for all the help he gave us in getting ready for this program. As we go to Norwalk, Connecticut, next. Go ahead, please. You're on the air. Well, uh, I want to talk about Carter's uh, legacy. Actually, eight of their representatives from Georgia are Republicans. Half of the senators are Republicans. Caller Leo Rebuffo, do you think uh, Jimmy Carter had an impact on this? Uh, I think the country was moving in a conservative direction since uh, the late 1960s with the election of uh, Nixon and George Wallace getting almost 10 million votes. The 60s was a polarized time, not a radical time. And Carter interrupted that. In a sense, he was a fluke because he held Southern votes and he held evangelical votes. So it's not Carter's fault or his perverse credit, as this caller suggests, but rather it's a matter of a trend that he temporarily interrupted, and he tried to adjust the Democratic Party politically to ride out that more conservative trend. He didn't succeed in his time. It appears politically Clinton has. We'll go up the mountaintop uh, near Santa Ynez, above Santa Barbara on Monday to do the Ronald Reagan program. And as we said, Lou Cannon will be our principal guest. Then the next week, it'll be the George Bush program from College Station, Texas, the George Bush uh, Presidential Library. And the final program will be about uh, our president right now, Bill Clinton. And it'll be from Hope, Arkansas, in the home where he was born, in that little community, which is a couple hours south of Little Rock. We go next. Two more calls left, this one and then another one. We go to Kansas City, Missouri next. Go ahead, please. Yes, I wonder if uh, Mr. Rebuffo might uh, evaluate a long-held assumption of mine, and it might draw a contrast between uh, President Carter and our current president. I assume that Carter was among the most moral of our presidents and was driven by and acted according to a sense of moral obligation and of duty than of some quest for power or political accomplishment. Could you comment on that? I don't think we've had many vastly immoral presidents. Uh, I think all of our presidents, even those who did quite badly, would say they were trying to do the, the right thing uh, in the public sphere. If you're talking about his, his personal life compared to Clinton's, uh, sure. Uh, I think we also should recognize, as I said at the outset, that Bill, uh, that Jimmy Carter was a complicated man. He was not without ambition. As Doug said before, he wanted as a young man to be chief of, of naval operations. And he wasn't immune to dirty tricks, either running for governor or persistently attacking the, quote, uh, Nixon-Ford administration when he ran against Ford in 1976. Uh, I think he was a moral man, as are most of our presidential candidates, but the system itself requires them uh, to dodge a little bit. In this just couple of minutes remaining, I want to make sure we take our cameras and look around this community of uh, Plains, Georgia, so you can see, get some context of what it looks like. It's not very big, as we said, just a little over 700 people. And Jimmy Carter's home is still here, where he comes frequently, as we were told earlier by 
uh, Fred Boyles. He taught some 38 of 52 weeks over here at the Plains uh, Maranatha Baptist Church uh, on Sunday where he teaches Sunday school. That's the main street, the big street here in the community. And off to the right is where the depot is, a picture you've been seeing uh, all morning long where our cameras are set up. And off to the right of that, uh, the uh, railroad tracks. And that wise, as we look at this community, when you teach these young people from the 4th, 5th, 8th, and 11th grades, what part of this community do they kind of turn on the most to? The students are very interested in the background as far as agriculture and that he was a peanut farmer. And that's quite intriguing to students. Also, looking at the downtown area, it hasn't changed much since about 1920. So that's also very intriguing. The history of the town and how it developed around the railroad coming through, um, all of those are things that tie in so well to, to the history stories that are told in many of the history books. So uh, students are just intrigued with a person that could have lived in a small town, how the community supported him in his presidential campaign, and that he still lives here in Plains. I want to tell the audience that the Plains Association of Lady Survivors, they call it the PALS Club, and the Plains Better Hometown Program were groups that uh, helped feed some of our people here. The hospitality here is extraordinary in this little community, very friendly place, and we want to thank Fred Boyles and all of his crew at the National Park Service. As we take our, I think we have, we have one more call left. Yeah, Beaumont, Texas, our last call. Go ahead, please. Okay, uh, hello, my name is Connie Wilson, and uh, I used to work there in Plains as a park ranger for the National Park Service. And I was wondering about the, uh, I lived there in 93, I was wondering about how uh, far has the boyhood home developed, because that time they were just acquiring the house, it was tied up in legal matters. I'll let you answer my question. Uh, Annette Weiss might know that uh, question, the answer to that question. Did you hear it? Yes, I did. Uh, the Boyhood Home Project is well underway right now. They began uh, tearing down and um, have started some rebuilding. The Boyhood Home itself is restored, and the store has been restored. Now they're getting ready to build the barns and the blacksmith shops and put it, the windmills in and um, comfort stations. Uh, I will say that the Clark House is also in the process of being restored too. So we're well underway. We hope that that project will go fast. We're looking forward to having that open to the public so that visitors can come in and step back in time and see what it was like to live in a home with no electricity and no running water. And I will say that that is something that is very intriguing to students to think that Jimmy Carter lived in a home with no electricity. Thank you, Annette Weiss, very much for joining us on this morning. And um, b before we leave, uh, we want to get one final comment from Leo Rebuffo. On, and I wonder, what I want to ask you is, what did you most like about Jimmy Carter so far in your studies, and what did you most dislike about him? Uh, what I most liked about him, if you mean viscerally, was his commitment uh, to human rights and basic decency. And what I most disliked uh, was his stubbornness and what he would call theologically the sin of pride. He once said following Niebuhr that pride was the number one sin and I think he combated it uh, all his life with mixed success. But, uh, but I would say that finally um, we should pay less attention to presidential quirks and uh, give Carter credit for having done about as well as could be done under very dis difficult circumstances. He didn't have much wiggle room in the late 1970s. Thank you, Leo Robuffo, for coming to us here from Washington, D.C., where you are a teacher at George Washington University. And final comment, we want to make sure those folks that are teachers and are watching, that they can get in touch with us at C-SPAN for C-SPAN in the classroom and get material that will be used in conjunction with this whole series. It'll be replayed December 20th to the 30th. You can tape it and use it in the classroom at cspan.org slash classroom or 202-626-4858 is the number. Folks are there at the uh, network right now to take your calls. If you're watching this live, call them or email them and you can join it and be ready for the next semester of your class in January. Thanks to everyone, your callers, the callers out there as always, a import, very important part of this program. You've just uh, watched three hours of the 39th President of the United States, Jimmy Carter, from Plains, Georgia. Have a good weekend.